Okay, just give me a countdown. Well, good afternoon. This is our last session. It's going to take us right through to our round table in a few hours from now. And uh, we're glad that you're back with us here watching in and those uh, here in the auditorium. And uh, we're thankful for being at First Baptist Church of Port Orange. Special thanks to Pastor Mike, to his son Elijah, who are up there doing all the audio for us. So he's not only the pastor, he's serving us as well, and we really appreciate that. So before our next speaker, we have a, a ministry that actually uh, helped to minister to our next speaker when he comes up, as well as many others. And they're going to tell you a little bit about the integral work that they do. It's called uh, DTI, Discipler Training International. So let's welcome Frank and Jeanette Mites. Let's welcome them up here today. Good afternoon. Um, so yeah, we are Frank and Jeanette. We live in Florida on the, on the West Coast, and uh, we are here uh, to support Elaine Bales, who spoke last night with JW Escape. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting because up until about three or four years ago, I didn't even know what a JW was. Um, but the reason we are here actually started 35 years ago, and it's a long story, but I'm going to make it really, really short for you all, because it started in the jungles of Bolivia, when the man who mentored, spiritually mentored me, our, um, was a missionary in Bolivia, and uh, they were uh, uh, with other missionaries, and the Lord brought this body of material, this discipleship material that changed our lives, it brought it to him, and he ended up sharing with another man who was a missionary as well. So now fast forward about 30 years, which is just a few years ago, and that other gentleman ended up in Texas, and he's in a jail ministry teaching the DTI materials to the convicts. But he's also teaching it in his church there in South Texas, and through those different people, it gets back to my mentor who lives in Reno, and invites us onto a phone call that has um, the people in Texas, but also a lady who, as we find out, lives five miles from our house, and that's Elaine, who has this wonderful JW Escape ministry. And so we did a kind of a meetup, a coffee thing, you know, I got the carnation on, so you know who I am, and that kind of thing. And so now we are part of that particular ministry. 35 years, you may think, wow, why did God wait that long? But, you know, for, for God, that's just a blink in the eye, right? But he was preparing and moving all the chess pieces around to put us in a position so that we can, as Al said, minister to the JWs. So that's where we came from. That's where we came from. But uh, Elaine and I have become very good friends. And so one of the things that she calls us her team, as we helped her uh, organize the ministry, we try to do all the stuff that, we can't, that she can't do. Okay, let's put it this way. We do all the stuff that she shouldn't do because she does wonderfully well what she does, and we can't do that. So one of the things that we do with our Discipler Training International is that we have curriculum that is free on both an app and on PDF, and the, the website uh, is up on the screen right now, which is www.disciplers.org. Go there and you can find everything that's free or you can also contact us. But what we have is curriculum that's designed to help a new believer grow in the faith, to develop their relationship with God. But when you have a JW that gets out and maybe they're listening to Elaine and maybe they get saved, what do they do now? They don't always know. We had to learn a lot about JW, so I don't say the wrong thing at the, wrong t at the right time. But we did a workshop online using this material uh, for about nine months with different people, but XJWs in the group, and we um, changed things to actually match what they needed to hear on that particular lesson. And those are on her website at jwescape.com. And so those are there along with some Bible studies that she does so that you can go and, and so that we get people who come and listen to that and, uh, and then grow because of that. But we also uh, do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Uh, we don't advertise it a whole lot, but if we have somebody who kind of reaches out, somebody that feels like I sense on Elaine's Facebook page, I help manage her Facebook page and answer questions and things, then I may reach out to somebody to see if they're open and interested to study. That's what 
JWs call it, right? Study. So that they're a little bit more, now they understand what we're doing. So I'm mentoring three women right now. One of them just got baptized a year ago, about uh, six months ago in a church. And uh, several of them are going to be able to mentor others, which is what we really want. That's what this is, should be going. And this is our prayer. And we're thinking God is going to do that. In addition, uh, Frank has been mentoring uh, Chris Marshall, who's going to speak next. And uh, that has been very meaningful for Frank as well. But that's kind of what we do. We've, uh, we're excited to be here. We've also done these workshops on discipleship in Cuba. Have nothing to do with JWs, but that's something else that we do. But they're actually down there in Cuba as well, right? We know that. So the, the, the last thing I wanted to share, our mission statement is based on Colossians 1, 28, 29. Okay? And that's where Paul is saying to the church, I admonish you that we grow and learn and teach everyone, and we emphasize the word everyone, because no one should be left out uh, to grow into spiritual maturity, spiritual fruitfulness, and spiritual reproduction. And I always thought that that everyone was all those sitting in the brown chairs in the church on a Sunday, but now I've come to realize everyone is all of those who are in bondage in these cults or Sado religions, as, as Al said. Um, that those are also the everyone that the Apostle Paul admonishes us to go out and get. So as you guys, whatever ministry you happen to be in, and help them get delivered um, or saved, then DTI is here to help them grow into those three things, maturity, fruitfulness, and reproduction. Thank you very much. Because spiritual babies don't reproduce. Ooh, I like that. It's always uh, good when someone throws a dynamite mugget, uh, nugget and then goes mic drop. I was like, wow, wow, praise God. <laughs> uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, again, I want to remind you, as the Lord puts it on your heart, whatever you give, we're going to be able to give back to the people who, you know, uh, paid to fly here and get here at, at their own expense. So help us with the expenses. Put whatever the Lord puts on your heart, put it in the basket. Let me also mention along the book tables, I've written about 13 books. I'm working on a 14th one now. They're all on Amazon, but I got about eight of them out on my table. I have a book about Mormons called uh, Mormonism Revisited and uh, uh, The Watchtower Revisited, Dangerous Doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses. But I'm known most for a book out there. It's a green book called Divine Appointments. And these are just the wild appointments I've had with people by being intentional. And if you are someone who wants to, you know, if you desire to have God use you on a daily basis, that's the book you're going to want because not that there's any set formula, but I could definitely set you on the right path to where you're going to be able to hear God's voice to talk to people when he whispers in your ear, that's the one. Uh, I also wrote a book on theology. I also have a book out there called, uh, you know, Knowing uh, or Jesus Revisited. Never accept the counterfeit, and there's a lot of counterfeit views of Jesus today. Not just, uh, you know, count, not just the views in the cults. There's views, there's counterfeit political views of Jesus and a whole bunch of other things. So make sure you get a hold of those books. Uh, you know, I have a suggested price, but I really don't care what you put in the basket. Take a book, and I'll be glad to sign any of them for you as well. So Chris Marshall rose to the position of ministerial servant in the Watchtower Society. He was a second-generation witness, and he worked his way to the Bethel headquarters where he became a Bethelite, as they were known. And on a personal note, I am so proud of this fine young man. He began to date a friend of uh, Dawn and I's who knew that I was well-versed on Watchtower Theology and wrote a book about it. Um, and that this led to Chris and I starting to meet weekly for probably, I don't know, good about five months, four or five months. Um, and one of the happiest days of my life was when Chris walked in. He, you had a smile on your face that day, whether you realized it. I looked a little different, so something happened. And, and he just looked at me and said the words that I needed to hear. And he said, I could see the deity of Jesus Christ. You know, I want you to know that when a former Jehovah's Witness says, I recognize the deity of Christ, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. Yeah, that, let's give the Lord a hand clap for that, can we? Yeah. 
And then I had the honor of baptizing him just a few months later. And then just a few months after that, marrying him and his bride, who, by the way, is uh, him and his bride, Christina, and I'm, I know she's watching in right now. They're going to be welcoming Emma Jean Marshall in about another month. So could we also give the Lord a hand clap for that? Their first child. But I remember sitting with him when he talked about baptism, and I looked him in the eye and said, are you sure? And I quoted the scripture verse where Jesus said, unless a man counts the cost, he doesn't build the house. I said, Chris, if you do this, your father and your stepmother, whom he loves, may never talk to you again. And they haven't talked to him in about two and a half, five years. Five years they haven't talked to him. So when I say hero of the faith, like I referred to with, um, no, well, Martha as well, but Elaine, I'm looking at Elaine, I couldn't get her name out. Um, I want you to meet another hero of the faith. His talk today is going to be powerful, and it's called Why I Am Not a Jehovah's Witness Today. Let's welcome Chris Marshall up here today. <laughs> this is only a second time, so I'll just throw that in so he feels even more comfortable. And it's always hard to talk after lunch, too. I feel like taking a nap, honestly. <laughs> <clears throat> but I was raised a Jehovah's Witness, um, born and raised. My father and mom were raised Jehovah's Witnesses as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, and also my, grandf my grandfather and grandmother were raised Witnesses too. Um, so I was taught at a very young age to be appreciative of my spiritual background. Um, there's a picture of, of me and my sisters growing up, probably taking a photo before a congregation meeting. But um, my mother was disfellowshipped actually right after I was born. So my father worked really hard in raising us uh, in the JW faith. Uh, he remarried after several years. You can probably flip the next slide. And um, my stepmother would take me out from, from door to door. Uh, she was a regular pioneer. So even before school, I would be with her going 70 hours a month in the field ministry. I yearned to be a regular pioneer too. I, I wanted to follow in my parents' um, footsteps. My parents instilled in me going, uh, going to Bethel and also being a pioneer as a parent would instill their child to go to college. Um, it was something that was such a high goal uh, for me. <clears throat> probably flip the next slide as well. I, I remember going to um, con conventions as a young uh, lad, and in the intermission points, you know, they would have the Bethel meetings. You know, there's always a Bethel light or, you know, in this case, a governing body member that was there. We used to idolize these guys. We, we wanted to be them. We, we pretty much worshiped them. Yeah, I'm looking back at, at it now. But uh, uh, it was something that I really wanted to do um, was to go to Bethel. We would uh, go to Bethel uh, for summer vacations, you know, when, when, when some parents or some families would go to the beach or, you know, go see other family members. We would go up to Bethel. You can probably flip to the next slide. I used to love walking around, seeing the governing bodies offices, seeing all the happy young faces, the young people. It seemed like so much fun. Um, my elder sister was later, was, was later disfellowshipped, and she went on to live with my birth mother, who, who, was, disfellowshipped office, who was disfellowshipped also. And I remember at a young age, uh, even before baptism, making the stand not to associate with my birth mother. I remember like it was just yesterday, my, my sister, uh, the middle child, was, uh, was about to be baptized. So my, my uh, parents gave her an, an, an ultimatum. In order to get baptized, you have to stop communication with your, with your birth mother. And I remember knocking on her door uh, and, and just surprising her and saying, you know, we, having my sister say, 
you know, she, she doesn't want to associate because she's not living for Jehovah. And I saw how happy that made my parents and how proud they were of my sister. So I, I jumped right in that conversation as well and said, you know, Mom, I don't associate with you as well because you're not a Jehovah's Witness anymore. That was, that was very tough. I can only imagine how traumatic that was for her and, and how traumatic that was for my sister and myself as well. But I was later baptized and entered the full-time ministry shortly after that. Um, I regular pioneered for several years. You can probably flip to the next slide. That was me. Um, my dad's on the other side. I felt the need to cut him out because he's still in Bethel. But um, I attended pioneer school with my father. Um, we, we downsized. We moved to where the need was greater. I eventually became a ministerial servant. Um, I had several um, privileges and opportunities. You can probably flip to the next slide. Uh, speaking at certain assembly halls and conventions as well. Um, I felt at the time it really strengthened my faith. Um, I, I was very young in my congregation, um, so I was used heavily. You can probably flip the next slide as well. I had the opportunity to go to Germany uh, for the international convention. Um, uh, and that's something that has always stuck with me, you know, seeing the uniformity of the Jehovah's Witness faith, seeing them all meet together, um, that, that really stuck with me. And as a young man, uh, that was really deceiving. Uh, the next slide, I, I went to Guatemala for about a month, um, preached there. Uh, and again, it was just faith strengthening uh, trips. But there was always fear behind each, each one of these trips. It was always fear behind each privilege you got. Um, the fears like, am I going to make my 70 hours this month? You know, um, you, you always hear of the pioneer that didn't make their hours. You know, uh, they're sent back into the elders' room. They're, they're talked to. You know, even though those meetings are supposed to be somewhat encouraging, you always leave feeling like, man, I should have done more. I can always do more. I'm not doing enough. It's just exhausting. And you always feel guilty. I thought the more I did for Jehovah, uh, the more he would find favor in me. I remember my dad telling me, telling me uh, the more I actively served Jehovah, the less likely I was to sin. And I took those words very seriously. One, um, <clears throat> one analogy my mother, my, my stepmother told me that helped her stay out of trouble when she was younger. She imagined Jehovah over her head with a hammer. And uh, if she were to sin or to, you know, mess up, if Armageddon came, he would just slap that hammer right down on her. She would be no longer in existence. And I, I took that to heart, too. You know, that is what drove me to want to do more, to, to not fall into sin. My parents were accepted to Bethel. I remember my dad coming into my room at 19 explaining uh, that they were going. I was so happy for them. Um, I, was, uh, I was somewhat devastated in a way because, you know, I, I was living with my parents, but I, I wanted them to achieve that opportunity. Um, and I was willing to make that sacrifice. So I moved out. I stayed with a brother on his, his property. I worked at his house for rent um, while working a full-time job, uh, barely making ends meet, um, surviving on at least one or two meals a day if I could afford that. But um, I was later accepted into Bethel. Uh, look at me cheesing. I was so happy. Uh, my dreams were coming true. This is what I always wanted. This is what my parents strove for. This is why they worked so hard. This is why they sacrificed so much. This is why I sacrificed so much for this moment right here. But I started having doubts uh, shortly after being in Bethel. Uh, being raised in the JW uh, faith, you know, they, they preach Bethel in the watchtower and in meetings as the closest thing to paradise earth. It, it really is the closest thing to paradise earth. I imagine my stay there would be uplifting. I'd be around the most spiritual people in the whole organization. But uh, I, was, I was definitely wrong. 
Um, I found myself bullied a lot of the times when I was there. Um, there was a lot of jealousy um, and this feeling of we're better than everybody else because we are Bethelites. You're not. Um, <clears throat> I, I understand people are imperfect, but Bethel was just not what it was advertised by the organization to be. I remember visiting home for a short while and uh, speaking with brothers about my time at Bethel. And it shocked me to, to hear what they had to say. Some of the same brothers that encouraged me to go to Bethel, they mentioned, oh man, I would, I would never send my kids to Bethel. And all, and all I can think of is, why, why'd you encourage me to go? Um, and I, I just kept wondering myself, like, is this right? You know, certain little flashes would come up in my mind, like, man, is this, is this really real? Is this, is this right? Around the same time, I also discovered many years ago, uh, a brother molested a child in my hall, in my Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. He and his wife actually uh, ran a daycare, too. And not only was his brother allowed to continue to run the daycare, but they didn't go to the authorities. They, they didn't go to the police. Nothing was, was, was brought up that was aware of my knowledge. I'm sure he was dealt with behind closed doors, but they were dealt with by the, he was dealt with by the wrong, the wrong people, not the authorities. Uh, when I went to the elders to discuss my frustrations over this, I was assured that all the proper measures were taken, um, but you know that just didn't sit right with me. I was later disfellowshipped after coming back home from spending a year in Bethel. I remember sitting in the back room uh, with uh, the three elders, you know, discussing what I did, what I'd done. I remember them asking me to leave the room, and I was sitting in this dark auditorium uh, and just begging, crying and begging, Lord Jehovah, please just forgive me, forgive me. And a thought popped up in my mind, and I, I could see the elders sitting in the room, and they weren't going over their Bibles, they weren't praying, they were looking at this piece of paper given to them by the faithful and discreet slave on how to handle me. And I was just thinking, man, this, how do they know if I'm repentant or not? They're not, they don't, they're not God, they don't know me. How, how do they know if I'm repentant? But uh, needless to say, I, I, I was disfellowship. I remember my father's words when I told him. <clears throat> he assured me uh, he loved me. He, I will always be his, his son, his only son, but um, unfortunately, uh, he loved the organization more. He loved Jehovah God more. That was, that was hard to hear. Uh, I was shortly fired from my job, uh, which was a company owned and ran by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. I had nowhere to go, no money to my name, um, nowhere to sleep except my car. I just remember feeling so lonely, so depressed. I mean, I even had thoughts of suicide. I thought, anything is better than this. I, I, I have no one, I have nothing. Uh, after the many phone calls I've made to my friends and family, uh, asking, can I just stay with you just for a few nights so I can get myself back on my feet? Um, after hearing no and no, I thought I'd go through with my plan of suicide. Um, I made one more phone call to my grandmother, um, who was actually inactive at the time, um, and she allowed me to stay with her. You know, it, uh, being inactive in the Trovis Witness faith means you're not um, you're not doing your field ministry enough, or you know, you're not going to every meeting uh, enough the way you should be. So they label you inactive, meaning you know, just to be cautious of this one in the congregation, because something is obviously not right if you're not, you know, going out in field ministry 70 hours a month. Um, right uh, before I was disfellowship, I remember the elders telling me to uh, um, <clears throat> say goodbye to, to all my family and friends, um, and they encouraged me to uh, go to the meeting where I was going to be announced as being disfellowship, and talk about embarrassment. I, they used to do it in the middle of the meeting, and you'd have to sit through the whole meeting while people looked back at you or 
or went to the bathroom and uh, uh, cut eyes at you. But uh, they recently moved it to the end of the meeting when I was disfellowshipped. And um, <clears throat> I just remember the gasps, the, the tr traumatic gasps and the, the, the people that, you know, I, I grew up with, you know, just looking at me like, what, what did you do? What, what have you done? And I, I remember as soon as I was announced, I just grabbed my psalm book and Bible and just left. Um, <clears throat> looking the, the other direction uh, as I walked through the door. I was disfellowshipped for almost two years, though. I, at this point, I moved to a different state. You know, I started attending the meetings there. I remember going to the elders so many times through, through those, you know, a year and a half to two years, just asking for forgiveness. Please, bring, bring me back, man. I, I, I'm repentant. I, I've stopped, you know, sinning. You know, I, I, I went to the elders, you know, first, um, when, when I was first as fellowship regarding, you know, what I was going through, and I was punished. So, I mean, that has to stand for something. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you guys. Please help me. Um, and they kept refusing, and they kept refusing. And I kept wondering, how, how do these men, how do these imperfect men know if I'm repentant or not? You know, I just want to see my dad again. I just want to see my family grandparents, I want to see my friends. Uh, that was a real traumatic experience, but I was shortly reinstated after that time, but um, after being reinstated, I was definitely treated differently. A lot of my friends that I grew up with did not socialize with me, um, and what I worked so hard to get so to get back into was just, was just so different. I remember elders coming up to me after, you know, um, getting certain privileges back or making certain comments at the meetings. And, you know, they would always uh, say um, kind of in a disrespectful way, oh, man, you would be going places if you didn't slip up. Or, oh, man, I can only see what you would be now if you did not, uh, you know, fall short. And I just remember just being so depressed again. You know, I made it all the way back. I struggled through those a uh, year and a half to two years, I'm back in the organization, but man, I, just, I feel more depressed than I ever had. The, the joy I had at first was definitely gone. Uh, I had a meeting with the elders um, shortly after that uh, and expressed to them some of the concerns I have regarding the organization. The, the literal, I started doing some secular research because I felt the need to, because things were just not adding up. And uh, I remember in the meeting them telling me that, hey, you need to be very careful. Whatever secular research you're doing that's not a part of the watchtower or the organization, it's just like being pornography. Um, they, they wanted me to, uh, to stop, and I, I, I wasn't. <laughs> what, what I was looking up was really good information, and I wanted answers. Um, so they disfellowshipped me again. <laughs> I remembered uh, in this particular meeting the elders didn't even bother to, to open up their Bible. You, usually, you know, there's always like a, a goodbye scripture, so to speak, you know, to, to send you on your way, but the, there, there wasn't even that. Um, and at this time, I, and I knew I believed in God or some type of a higher force, but I, I didn't know what that was. Um, and I was, I was really lost at this time, being, dis being disfellowshipped twice. I uh, actually uh, went to two churches, which, you know, was really hard to do because uh, I knew, you know, that was being an apostate. You know, that's the last thing you want to do. You know, if you ever see a video of, of the governing body or, or anyone talk about being an apostate, you know, as, as they speak about it as worse being than Satan the devil himself. <clears throat> um, and going to these churches, you know, that those you know conversations and such of, uh, of false religion popped back into my mind. Um, things like passing around the, the collection plate, being too political uh, in the church, and not being united uh, was was really hard for me. It scared me. Um, I actually, I actually didn't go back for for quite some time. Um, you know, again, I was I was very depressed, and I didn't know what to do, um, and I, I turned to, 
alcohol. I turned to marijuana. I turned to just about anything that could get me, you know, some type of high of some sort, some spiritual high or, or something in that nature. I would say close to my lowest point, um, I thought, you know, okay, I, I know I can do better. I, I wasn't raised this way. I will do better. You know, maybe I should work my way back up to being a Jehovah's Witness again. So after cleaning my act up a little bit, um, uh, I met a woman that came into my work one day. Um, she's now my wife, Christina. She, uh, <clears throat> we started to build a relationship together. We, we, we really hit it off. Um, and she told me about a, a pastor that dealt with a lot of witnesses. Um, and I was turned off from wanting to go down that path. I did not want to speak to anyone about you know, anyone who wasn't a witness about the witnesses. Um, I was very hesitant, but I met with Al anyway, and I, I, he assured me that not everything I learned from the witnesses was wrong. You know, they, that they do have it right in, in some aspects of, of certain things, and that was encouraging. That was good for me to hear. You know, uh, if someone would have came at me saying, you know, what you learned was wrong, everything you were taught is a lie, I, I would have been so turned off. I, I probably would have walked away. But hearing that reassurance was, was enough for me to keep going back week after week. Um, we took one topic at a time. We spent extra time on things that really bothered me, blood transfusions, voting. You know, most importantly, is Jesus God? That was, that was hard, you know. The Trinity is, can be very confusing, especially from someone who uh, grew up a witness. Um, <clears throat> I was encouraged to do my own research and continue to do my own research, which was uh, very unheard of. And I, I delved even deeper into, you know, looking up YouTube videos. I, I saw Elaine's videos that was really encouraging. I, I saw some other great videos that uh, meant a lot to me. Um, the information just blew my mind that I wasn't alone in this. You know, there's a lot of other people uh, that, that feel the same way that I do that are, are here for me. Um, <clears throat> some of the most kindergarten Bible truths really opened my eyes for the first time. I remember my wife uh, telling me about grace. There was no grace in the New World Translation. I, I had no idea what that word meant, grace. And to, to have that explained to me uh, just brought me to tears. I remember thinking that, you know, that's true love, grace. Right there, that's, that's Jesus, love. Not just fellowshipping, not shaming, but uh, grace. You can probably flip to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, later baptized at the uh, Greater Grace Church that same year. That's me. That's Pastor Al. Um, that was such a proud moment in my life. Um, I, I enjoyed that tremendously. Um, <clears throat> it's still a battle every day, though. I miss my family. I miss my friends. You know, I, I think about the, the young one um, I'm about to have with my wife, and I think about, you know, man, she's not going to meet her grandparents. She's not going to meet her great-grandparents, you know. It's, it's sad, but I feel such security knowing the actual truth, and that's, that's the truth right there. I feel blessed to experience all that I have experienced, and I'm, I feel grateful that uh, my eyes were open to true Christianity, but most importantly, my eyes were open to Christ, uh, the one and only. I, so if you're still struggling, um, whether you are a Jehovah's Witness looking out or if you're no longer a witness but your mind is still in there, uh, just don't stop praying. Uh, pray to Jesus. Find support outside of the, J the JW faith. I mean, I, I still need support every day. Just on the flight up here, I was thinking to myself, man, why am I doing this? Jeez. Or, do, I, do I want to speak again at a conference? You know, my, why am I putting myself through this? And uh, I, I had just uh, reformed myself that, you know, I'm doing this for Jesus, man. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this for him. I'm doing this for, for other ones who are, uh, who are in, in my shoes, who, who have been there. It's difficult to leave. Uh, and physically go against 
everything you've been engraved to believe. And so many years, so many years and sacrifices cultivating, you know, what you've learned. But this scripture always stuck out with me, uh, Matthew 10, 38 uh, through 40. And it uh, actually reads, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And that's exactly what you're doing, whether it's Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, or any cult. When you leave, you're, you're leaving your life behind. You're leaving your friends, your family, everything you cultivate it behind. But, man, how refreshing. Verse 39, uh, for my sake, you will find that again. In verse 40, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Powerful. Thank you. Once again, let's tell Chris we appreciate what he said. Today. Wow. You know, some out there might be wondering, well, what happens when somebody sins with you within biblical Christianity? And, and we, not, we actually never talked about why you got fellowship. So don't, this example I'm giving has nothing to do with him because I don't know what it was. Um, but let me tell you how we deal with that, and I did as a pastor, and how I still do. I remember we were up near a, a Christian university where we lived, and there was a couple that we were close to, and they, my phone rang at 5.30 in the morning, and I picked up the phone, and it was a young lady, and she was crying, and I said, calm down, calm down, it's okay, it's okay, and finally when she composed herself, I knew who it was. It was a, a couple that we knew who were going to be married um, fairly soon, and evidently what happened is they went too far. Um, they went too far, and I, and I, the, being the pastor I'm at, I am, and, and this is also another thing that I notice with, with like uh, Jehovah's Witness elders and, and in particular Mormon bishops with the questions that they ask and stuff, and maybe Mike could talk more about that. I don't need details. Sin is sin. I, don't, I have no desire to get into people's lives or embarrass them and get details, and, and I just said, look, you know, I, I don't know what too far means, but obviously you went to a place you shouldn't have gone. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And I went, I have some great news. And, and she was like, did you hear what I just said? I said, what's the, f it's five, it's not even six o'clock in the morning. When did you guys get up? Just now, a little while ago. And what's the first thing you did? We called you. And what did Jesus say about sin? Tell me about what you did. Here's what Jesus said. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. The first thing you did when you got up was call me. That's repentance. So let's pray. And I prayed with him. And then I said, put him on the phone, not you. Because I usually know in this area, it's usually the guys who are, I said, don't you put your hands on her again until the wedding. Do you hear me? I do. <laughs> God bless. We'll see you later. That's how we deal with that. And that's how Christ deals with it, because Micah 6.8 says this, love mercy, Chris talked about this, do justice and walk humbly before our God. That's the difference. And Chris talked about uniformity. Cults do not have unity, they have uniformity. Get in line or else. That's not unity, as he so aptly pointed out. I have a, uh, a saying that God just dropped into my lap one day, um, and it's a healthy view of God results in a healthy walk with God. When your God is like Thor, like the Watchtower, or, you know, in other pseudo-Christian groups where it's works, 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 that's, good. that's how you're going to walk. That's how you're, that you're going to become a judgmental person when you see that. And when you believe that, and when that's your view of God, it's so important for us to have a healthy view of God. Many of us grew up with abusive parents. I did, in particular, my father. And so it was very easy for me to project that to my heavenly father. And I thank God that I don't. And don't you either, watching in. Because you've had a bad experience in the Watchtower or in the LDS Church or wherever, that was a different God. I need to tell you that. 
It's not the God of the Bible. It's not the God who wrote Micah 6, 8. Because he said, love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly. And forgive always. We were talking about that, right, Bill? We were talking about that at lunch. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. To forgive. I want you to know that in forgiveness, you know how I know I'm in a good place with the Lord? Is when I hear a word about somebody who wronged me and they're doing well, and I actually say, that's, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. Don't we all want to be in that place, man? Isn't there enough of this going on? In fact, when you point your finger at someone, I don't know if you notice, one finger goes that way, three are coming right back at you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let me also address one last thing, because I think this is important. The congregation knew what somebody was doing, and they let them stay. Uh, Within biblical Christianity, there is no, like, clergy parishioner uh, confidence. In Virginia, I had a woman start telling me things, and I knew that what she was about to tell me, I said, I, I have to stop you and tell you, if you continue in this conversation with me and you go where you're going, uh, you need to know that I am going, I'm going to have, the police are going to get involved. I cannot, I will not with, I can't, it involved little children. I cannot hear this and not do anything. My conscience won't allow it. The law also doesn't allow it. And I don't believe that that's the right thing to do. And so, you know, we're not afraid to report those things. We don't have this complex that somehow, like, we can't talk about abuse that happened. Like, many churches in a very bizarre and sick way think that they're protecting Jesus. The last time I checked, Jesus doesn't need protection. <laughs> Amen? We're the ones that need protection. Okay, so we're going to be taking a quick break, and what I do want, what I want to do is for the sake of time, our last two speakers, Dave Henke and then um, Mike Wilder, we're, we're basically going to go back to back, because then we're going to do a round table. So this is going to be our last break before the round table, because we'll take a short break at the round table, too. So um, let's take a, a, let's do this. Let's take a 10-minute break. It's 2 o'clock. Let's be back here at 10 after 2, and we're going to hear our sister, Christy Darlington. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Amen.
I think I see it now. Okay, it's green. Is that working? Okay, cool. I think I hear it. That's good. So um, I'll go ahead and turn it off just so it doesn't go dead. And then I'll turn it on.
Hello, 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 hello. Yep, there you go. All right, let's do a countdown. Here we go, everybody. Here we go. So we want to welcome you back after a short break. And we're going to continue our program this afternoon. And we have another excellent speaker who's going to really get a little meaty with us and get into the scriptures. Uh, she came to us all the way from Colorado today. And she is with Witnesses for Jesus Incorporated, which is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is dedicated to sharing the good news of the eternal salvation in Jesus Christ with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, uh, Latter-day Saints. So whether you're currently involved in either one of these groups or you have friends or relatives who are involved, Christy says this ministry is for you, and I'm sure at the end of her talk she'll give you the web address and all the information. Her talk today is entitled, Finding Christ in the Hebrew Scriptures. So let's welcome Christy to the platform here this afternoon. Hey, you do it all. Gets it, she gets it ready. She goes behind the camera and in front of the camera. Okay. You want to use the handheld there? Yeah, I'm just doing uh, the video because um, I'm going to be making a video for the Witnesses for Jesus app. So those of you online and local here, too, if you want to see a bunch of the videos I put together, I have a YouTube channel, Wit for Jesus. You have to put Wit for Jesus YouTube because Google likes to change the searches to Wet for Jesus, which is not my channel. So they like to play games with my stuff online. But I have a YouTube channel. I've got also on your phone. Just download the Witnesses for Jesus app. It's just like Witnesses Now for Jesus, but it's Witnesses for Jesus. And that you can get all kinds of stuff. Um, our ministry, Witnesses for Jesus, uh, has resources on both Jehovah's Witnesses and on Mormonism. Those are our two specialties. But we also have some general information. How can you tell if you're in an unhealthy religious group? Um, a cult can be defined not just by the doctrines, which if you get Jesus wrong, you get the gospel wrong. You know, that's a heretical group. But... Um, also, it's the sociological aspect of control. They're the only way to God. They have the truth nobody else knows. Those are all signs of a cult. And so I have articles on the website to help people just, just coming out of a cult. How do you find a good church? So check out 4witness.org, the number 4, witness, W-I-T-N-E-S is dot org. And, um, and Pastor Al introduced me. I'm Christy Darlington. I write all my books as Christina because that's my legal name, Christina Darlington. But I have a number of books out, and that's on the back table. You can find them on Amazon and on our website. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into this ministry, helping people come out of cults. I grew up in a Christian home where I got to learn about Jesus at a very young age. I was five years old when I accepted the Lord into my life. I wanted to, you know, be with him forever. And I didn't understand everything. Of course, I was five. But the Lord just drew me into fellowship with him through his word. I went to a number of different non-denominational and denominational churches growing up. My family didn't just put our, our pillar under one denomination we kind of went wherever the word was preached and that's the neat thing about knowing Christ is if you have the Lord and his Holy Spirit dwelling in you he will give you discernment and he will show you where to plug in where you can fellowship with other believers who loved the Lord and his word as well so I was five years old when I accepted Christ and my dad began to do family Bible studies with us just reading the Bible my parents both were involved with the navigator which is a Christian discipleship ministry that helps people learn how to read the Bible and understand it for themselves. So my background was, you know, I grew up learning the word. We were reading the Bible together as a family. I was involved in the Awana program, learning Bible verses as young as I can remember. And um, also we were working on memorizing scripture. So I I learned the Beatitudes scripture, Matthew chapter 5. Don't ask me to quote all these now, but I, I learned several books by heart. Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, parts of Colossians, and James. I used to be able to quote them all the way through. I'm not quite as good anymore, but it does come in handy when you know the word, and then you spend time with the Lord. The, those scriptures come to mind when you're being faced with different doctrinal things. 
So when I was, um, when I was about uh, middle teenage years, my cousin became involved with the Mormon church. And since I grew up in an evangelical Christian home, I thought, I just thought everybody knew that Mormonism was a cult. And again, when I talk about cult, we're not just talking about doctrine, but also the, the sociological control that they have in the religion. And I thought, wow, why did he become th that? Why did he join that group? I didn't understand it. And um, so he, he's a couple years older than me. And when I graduated from high school, he was on his mission for the Mormon church. And so he... His background is he grew up in, his dad was a Baptist, and I don't know about what his mom claimed to be, but they got divorced when he was younger, and the Mormon church had their families all together. He started dating an LDS girlfriend, and so he was drawn into the Mormon church because of that family togetherness that he saw in her family. And a lot of people get into cults and false religions not because they're necessarily looking for the information, although Jehovah's Witnesses are very good at saying, we know the truth, we'll teach you the Bible. That is a big draw to people getting into the Jehovah's Witnesses. But then other folks get in just because they were there at their door knocking when they needed someone. And for, in his case, Mormonism offered that family atmosphere that he so greatly longed for. So I uh, started talking to him on his mission through letters. At that time, they didn't allow any other contact. Um, I think he could call home once a year, but it was for the two-year mission, just uh, writing letters back and forth. And after about a year of going back and forth on Scripture, and I was arguing, you know, salvation is by grace. Faith in Christ alone is enough. And he's like, no, you need to add your works. Faith without works is dead. And so we had the Bible ping pong going on. And I was like, man, I can't get through to him. I would share my verses. And he always had a way of reinterpreting those scripture verses. And I didn't know what to do with all that. So I thought, you know what? I need to study Mormonism. I need to understand what it is that keeps him tied to the Mormon church's interpretation. And it's then that I got a hold of books like Ed Decker, A to Z of Mormonism, and Ron Rhodes, Reasoning from the Scriptures with the Mormons, and Bill McKeever. He has a number of good um, books on Mormonism. And I just started studying everything I could get my hand on. So it was about a year into our correspondence that I got educated, and I started challenging him, do you really believe you can become a god someday, that you'll have a planet of your own? And at first he denied it, but then I went to those books and I started quoting, you know, Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, and Joseph Smith's King Fall at Discourse, where he said that God was once a man like us and, and dwelt on the earth, and that it, it's our job to become, learn to be gods, and going from one, you know, plan to another, or basically you know, that we are gods in embryo, as Lorenzo Snow, one of the Mormon prophets, said. And I started challenging him with the quotes from his literature. And he's like, where did you get your information? Are you reading anti-Mormon literature? <laughs> and I'm, well, I hated to admit it, but yes, I was. <laughs> and the fact is, I started, you know, I and he's like, you don't know, they lie about us. Those anti-Mormons, and they, they tell us things that aren't true. So where do you go to learn the truth? You talk to the Mormon missionaries. You don't talk to, you know, the anti-Mormon who left or the ex-Mormon who left. And so for a while there, I was like, hmm, I'd read what Ed Decker said, but my cousin said they're all lying. So I said, I know what I need to do. I need to get the books. I need to study. I'm going to go check these quotes out. So I started researching and getting a hold of the actual, you know, Joseph Smith's teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. And I read King Follett Discourse in that book. And then I got a hold of the Journal of Discourses and History of the Church, uh, the documentary History of the Church that the church produced. And you could read all these things. I'm like, these books are right on. Everything they said is exactly how the quote read. And it's in context. And I thought, wow, okay, so now I'm armed with the, the information. I go back to my cousin and try to help him out of this cult. Well, unfortunately, as I got educated, he 
realized that I wasn't going to convert to Mormonism. And all he wanted to know is if I was going to accept him as a Christian like him. And I'm like, but you're teaching false doctrines. And the more I studied, man becoming gods, that doctrine? Well, where did that come from? Well, Genesis 3, chapter 3, you will be as gods knowing good and evil. Said, Do you realize you're following Satan when you believe that lie? Well, that last question was the final thing that made my cousin decide that I was too dangerous to talk to. I don't know if that's what he, he didn't use that word dangerous, but he says, you're calling me a follower of Satan, and so therefore I don't want to talk to you anymore. And it was really hard for me because I'm like, why don't you just look at what the scriptures say and read it without Joseph Smith's reinterpretation? And, and I began to see that there was more holding him into the Mormon church than, than just the facts. It wasn't just about the information and the fact that it contradicted the Bible because his heart was devoted to the Mormon prophets, to the leadership in the church, to this culture that he had now adopted, and he married a Mormon. They were, he was raising his family. I mean, this is a few years after that, but of course he got married after his mission. And, um, and he liked the standards they provided, the structure they provided for him to have the family he always wanted. And so recognizing that, I started to feel like I really felt a burden for him. I'm like, wow, he's caught in this web of deception, and he... he he can't get free because his heart is caught. And really, that is the situation. I began to realize in other groups as well that, that until their heart is, is one, their mind is closed. And so I, uh, right about the time that my cousin stopped talking to me, Jehovah's Witnesses showed up at my door. And I thought, oh, great, when the doorbell rang, God's going to send me Mormons to talk to you because I now know how to talk to Mormons. I was like, yes. And I opened the door. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I thought, uh-oh, I don't know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses. Needless to know, a, uh, a week before that encounter at the door, um, a pastor at our church had challenged us to share Christ with somebody, whoever the Lord brought to us that week. And I thought, okay, well, the Lord's bringing the Mormons for me to talk to another, another group of Mormons. And it wasn't Mormons. It was Jehovah's Witnesses. And since I didn't know what to say, I wasn't prepared. I said, well, I'm sorry. I have my own faith. I'm a Christian. And I closed the door. Well, that wasn't the end. The Holy Spirit got a hold of me and convicted me. And he says, you know that promise you made this last weekend that you were going to share Christ? And you could have at least shared your testimony. And I thought, uh, yeah, I guess I could have, but I don't know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses. What if they ask me a question? I don't know how to answer. And so I, I, I was afraid to talk to them. So that night, the Lord convicted me to start studying. So I'm like, Mom and Dad, what books do you have on Jehovah's Witnesses? And I read everything I could. And, and then the next day, uh, I looked out the door. Are there Jehovah's Witnesses coming down the street? Maybe the Lord will bring them back to me. And um, no, there were no witnesses that next day. And I looked out the door the, the next day after that, and I'm like, I missed my opportunity. Lord, will you give me another chance? If you bring them back to my door, I'll witness to them. Well, they didn't come back to my door. However, it was three days after that. I was sitting um, in the car. My dad and I were working on properties, fixing things up, because uh, that's what he did as his business. And I was a teenager, kind of helping him along um, until, you know, I wasn't on my own yet. So... I was helping my dad on this property. We were fixing up, and uh, we went for lunch to get some supplies. And I stayed in the car eating our packed lunch. And Kevin Quick got on the radio uh, program. I think it was Truth to Transform with D. James Kennedy. I'm not sure, but it, I think it was his program. And he gave his testimony coming out of the watchtower talking about going door to door and how in all those years of going door to door, nobody ever shared Christ with him. And he just shared his story. And I'm like, yeah, I know, Lord. I didn't share either. <laughs> and I felt convicted. This is Monday. Um, so the, the witnesses came on Saturday. And so I had Sunday church. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't share Christ that week. And I felt bad. You know, Monday I hear Kevin Quick's testimony. I'm like, yeah, Lord, I'm studying. I'm reading these books. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how to share my faith. Tuesday, this guy came over with, a, with another guy, uh, Lane Carpet at one of our rental properties. And so as he was laying carpet in the closet, I thought, okay, all right, 
I'm going to share Christ. I don't know if this guy's a Christian. I don't know what he believes, but I'm going to at least ask him if he thinks he's going to go to heaven when he dies. And, I, and so I asked him that, and I thought, in the closet is kind of good because if he gets mad at me, I can dart out the door real quick. <laughs> I was so nervous. So I, I'm like, Steve, do you know uh, if you're going to go to heaven when you die? Well, so he's laying, you know, his carpet tools, getting it packed down in the corner. And he turns around and looks at me and he says, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to go to heaven. I'm like, well, why? He's like, well, I don't believe that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to do that. And I thought, wait a minute. Who doesn't believe in going to heaven when they die? What religion is that? Oh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Steve, are you a Jehovah's Witness? And he says, yeah, I am. I wondered. I was reading about Jehovah's Witnesses the other night. And, and then we got talking. I said, Steve, what is the one thing that you think, one belief that you have that is different than what I as a Christian would believe what, what, what we're taught? And he says, oh, that is definitely the Trinity. So, so what happened is he mentioned the Trinity, and I'm like, well, why don't you believe in the Trinity? He's like, well, you know what? It's too, it would take us too long to, to, to explain this right now, but I'll tell you what. I and my wife can come over with you and your dad, and we'll do a Bible study. And I've got a brochure. Should you believe in the Trinity? We'll go through that together. So I'm like, okay. All right, we'll do that. So we met, set up an appointment to go through their brochure, Should You Believe in the Trinity? Well, that was the 1989 edition of Should You Believe in the Trinity? And when I got that, I couldn't believe what I found. I read that, and I learned things I never heard before. That the Trinity doctrine was from paganism, that um, this idea that Jesus is a son of God and therefore can't be God? Well, I thought son of God meant he is God. So how could he, well, and then they would ask the question, well, if he's a son of God, how can he be God at the same time? You know, are, there, is, are they all one person? I'm like, well, no, um, I don't know why I believe what I do. And then I was reading about the uh, anti-Nicene church fathers, the ones before Nicaea, and they talked about the Creed of Nicaea. And supposedly, all those church fathers, like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, uh, Clement of Alexandria, they all taught that Jesus is not God. That's what the Watchtower claimed. And I never heard this before either. So then I was like a little shook up because I'm reading this brochure and I'm like, I never, I never seen these things before. And so I did some more research. And Went to the library and got more books, and I found a book uh, by Robert Bowman that he wrote a, a dealing with the Watchtower's brochure on the Trinity. I read that, and then there was another book by Angel Arlano. I forget how he says his name, but it had quotes about the Watchtower quotes, and his photocopies were really poor, but he showed where they were misquoting things. I thought, ooh, okay. And I'm like, Dad, before Steve comes over for the next study, let's go to the library because, you know, we need to check these quotes out. So we got his book, and I took the photocopies of the quotes, and I went to the library, and I sourced all the quotes he had, and then I since found more quotes. But I sourced the quotes that I could get a hold of. I wrote the Watchtower Society, got their um, bibliography for the brochure. So then I could get the actual page numbers that they were citing and I got the actual editions of the books. And lo and behold, I wrote, yes, you should believe in the Trinity as a result. But what we did is that, um, that next meeting with Steve, we started going through the photocopies of the literature, of the quotes in context, because the watcher completely lied about who Jesus is. In fact, like, to, for example, Clement of Alexandria, he, they said that he taught that he, Jesus was next to the only omnipotent father, but not equal to him. The Watchtower has a quote that ends, next to the only omnipotent father, end quote, and then not equal to him. And, and they say not equal to him is not quoted. I go into the church father volumes, and he says the divine word, he that is truly most manifest deity, he is made equal to the Lord of the universe. That is Clement's words, and the Watchtower said he's not equal. Complete and utter lies. And there were several examples of that that we showed Steve and his wife. Well, Steve's like, finally, he just kind of throws the brochure aside. You know, we don't need the brochure. We could just study the Bible for ourselves and, and, and not use the Watchtower literature. I don't know why they said what they did in their quotes, but we'll just use the Bible. 
So then we went through the Bible, and, I, and I, as I was studying, I learned about how they twist the scripture, how they make Jesus a God, and how, like, for example, in Proverbs 8, speaking of wisdom, he says that I wisdom... You know, this is the Jehovah produced me in the New World Translation. Well, think about this for a minute. If Jehovah produced wisdom, does that mean that there was a certain time when Jehovah had no wisdom? What kind of God is that that had no wisdom? And I started thinking about that. And I look in my Bible, and in my version of the Bible, it says that Jehovah brought me forth, or I forget the translation now, but it's not produced. It was more how God brought wisdom into creating the world. And if this is a picture of Christ, you know, um, there's another place where it says that, you know, he, God is from everlasting to everlasting. And wisdom has to be as eternal as God is. If God is eternal, and there, it wouldn't make sense that God would not have wisdom. And if this is a picture of Christ, instead of teaching that Jesus was created, that Proverbs 8 would actually teach that Jesus is as eternal as the Father is, if wisdom is a picture of Christ. And, like, there are several other things that they do with scriptures where if you look at them in context, it can say the very opposite. So, anyway, I, I uh, from the, all the research, wrote a first edition of Yes, You Should Believe in the Trinity back in uh, 98. Witness Inc. published 1,000 copies of the book. I spoke at their convention. We sold out all the copies over, you know, a few years. And until just this last month, I, I was out, it was out of print. But I just got it redone, double the documentation. I've researched so much more. I ha even have a Greek and Hebrew scholar who answered some of the mistranslations in the New World um, Translation, and it's in one of the chapters of the book. But this whole thing of you know, who is Jesus is the foundational question that anybody in a false religion has to come to grips with if they're going to come out. And so I titled my talk, Finding Christ in the Hebrew Scriptures, because my story goes on. So I have a ministry to Mormons and ministry to Jehovah's Witnesses. And we, um, a few years ago, I had a ex-Mormon couple, Lee and Kathy Baker, Lee was a bishop in the Mormon church. He had a line of priesthood line of authority that went to Thomas S. Monson, just a few guys from Thomas S. Monson, who was one of the prophets of the church. Uh, I, I, and I'm not going to go into explaining what that is, but to a Mormon who hears that, that was very, like, he had authority. Like, he really knew. Kind of like the Bethelite here, Chris, ex-Bethelite. If you're, if you're connected with the closest you are to their source, the more credibility you have. And so in the case of, of this bishop, he, he had a natural credibility with Mormons. And he and his wife had come out of Mormonism, had gotten discipled by a Christian pastor who lived, you know, I, uh, he was only a couple hours away from me. And so I got to meet him in one of our support groups. And then he got involved with several ministries. Mine was one, but there were several others that had taken him and his wife over to Israel. And uh, they had done the bishop's tour for ex-Mormons. And, and he, he espoused all the beliefs of Christianity, you know, who Jesus is and what the gospel is. And we even started a radio show that was aired in Utah. It was a call-in program for half an hour, once a week on Saturday. And so for six years, he served with our missionary, mission ministry. And our ministry sponsored his radio program for, I think, four, three or four years. And... We saw, I, I estimate about 400 Mormons come out of Mormonism through their program. So it was really awesome. He had a, his YouTube videos, had thousands of views. And we, every day we were getting lots of views from his explaining how Mormonism is, is, is counterfeit. Well, they even went over to Africa for our ministry. We had a radio program that in Africa in Worship FM, Liberia. A lot of Mormons were working in that country. And so our ministry sponsored that as well. But all of a sudden, he and his wife denounced the Christian faith. It was literally like overnight for me. I mean, I didn't know anything about it. But he ran into this Jewish rabbi who makes it his goal to deconvert people from Christianity and get them to go to Judaism. The scary thing about this, this particular group is that they, especially for ex-Mormons, they use Mormonism as an example, and they'll say, okay, 
You know how Christians view Mormons as a counterfeit of Christianity, as the cult of Christianity, if you will. Uses the same terms, but the Mormonism twists. Our meanings are different, like Don Vino talked about. And so what this rabbi does is then he goes and he takes Judaism and compares it to Christianity. And he says, we do the same thing that the cults do. And I was like, what in the heck? And so every example that he would give, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details on that, but basically what he did is he redefined what Judaism is and said that Christianity became the cult of Judaism. Like Mormonism, he'll say, like Mormonism is to Christianity, so Christianity is to Judaism. So I was like, it, it really threw me for a loop because I never studied Judaism to that level. I knew the basic messianic prophecies, all the prophecies that we learn as Christians and, and even Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who tones for our sins. Well, for the Jewish interpretation now, it's that that is the nation of Israel paying for the sins that, that of, of the world through, like, the Holocaust, for example. They've reinterpreted all those passages. So the servant is Israel. And, of course, there's major problems with that interpretation. But I was like, I never heard of this. And he's my, here's my friend who had served in the ministry for, for all these years. And within three months of watching this rabbi online, he flipped. And now saw all those verses differently, saw Christianity as a counterfeit, and he closed the door. He At first he wanted to discuss it, but then when I would come up with answers, and not just me, other ministries reached out to him, he wouldn't listen to it because he, he was now twisted into thinking that this rabbi had the truth rather than, you know, reading the Bible on his own. And, and the thing that this rabbi did is he would go into Hebrew. Well, we didn't train this bishop and his wife how to deal with the Hebrew twisting of the Jewish rabbis. And so I studied Michael Brown's materials. I studied One for Israel's materials, everything I could get a hold of, and created a series on my YouTube channel dealing with the lies of that rabbi, dealing with how they twist the scriptures. And um, that came as a result of, of losing this uh, bishop. But today, what I want to do now, finding Christ in the Hebrew scriptures, I'm going to start with the premise of the, the Talmudic understanding now, Talmud is kind of middle century doctrine, d document, but it's the closest thing we have to showing how the early rabbis viewed the messianic prophecies. And when you're dealing with a rabbi now who's telling you that Christianity distorts Judaism, what I found out is that that's not the case at all. Christianity actually followed what the, how the ancient rabbis viewed these scriptures. And then out of that, we see the New Testament interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures showing who Jesus is. So I'm going to briefly go over that, kind of given a foundation for why we believe what we believe as Christians. And then we're going to go into how the New Testament writers, the Christian writers of the Christian Greek scriptures, uh, quoted the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament text, applying passages of Jehovah God to Jesus Christ. So I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. I gave you guys handouts, and if you missed any of these handouts, you can get them um, on the chair up front. And then I'm going to be posting this video in my app, uh, Witnesses for Jesus app, and online I'll have a link where those of you who will be watching this online will be able to download the handouts. So let's go ahead and uh, finding Christ in the Hebrew scriptures. Let's go to the next slide. How did Abraham see Christ? I'm going to be quoting from the New World Translation, the 1984 edition of the New World Translation, because as I draw parallels, I want to give you guys tools on how to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to show who Jesus is. So what's the first thing we see? Um, in Luke 24, 27, it talks about Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And it, the text says, And starting with Moses and all the prophets, he, speaking of Christ, interpreted to them things pertaining to himself in all of the scriptures. And what I learned as I started studying the Talmudic literature is that the rabbis would look at different stories in the Bible, like the story of Joseph, like the story of Moses, and they would draw parallels to the Messiah must have these elements. Um, I'll go into more of that as we go through it. But So what Christ did when he taught on the road to Emmaus, he started with Moses and explained 
how, like for example, Moses in the wilderness, in uh, Soda 14 of the, of the Talmud, uh, um, they, the rabbis talk about how Moses, when Israel had sinned, Moses stood before God and says, God, take my life. Do not destroy Israel. What did he do? He essentially offered his soul on behalf of Israel. And the rabbis in Soda 14 of the Talmud actually draw that parallel and say that, the Messiah, that this suffering servant in Isaiah who offers his soul on behalf of Israel and atones for Israel was like Moses in the Old Testament who offered his soul on behalf of Israel. So Moses was like a picture of Christ. What do we see in the New Testament? We see that parallel drawn by the New Testament writers. Um, and we also, we just see a lot of midrashing of the text this is another term for it in the Jewish uh, understanding where they take a Hebrew story and draw it, a parallel to the Messiah, to Christ. And it's fascinating to study the Talmudic references. I don't have Soda 14 on your paper, but I'm just telling you, I'm going to throw some stuff out. Um, but that is another example of how the rabbis viewed Christ in the first century, and now we see in Jesus, when he taught them on the road, he did the exact same thing, drawing parallels to himself. And then we see in John 5, 39 through 40, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses have a question in their literature. What is the theme of the Bible? And they'll tell you that the theme is Jehovah's kingdom, right? But what does the scripture say in John 5, 39 through 40? You are searching the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal, everlasting life. And these are the very ones that bear witness about me. And you do not want to come to me that you may have life. So what is the theme of the scriptures? Is it Jehovah's kingdom or is it coming to Christ? Coming to Christ. That is absolutely right. And in Revelation 19.10, we read, For the witness concerning Jesus is what inspires prophecy. Interesting. I have a quote here um, on the slide. It's not in your handouts, but Sanhedrin 99a of the Jewish Talmud. It says, In their prophecies with regard to redemption and the end of days, all the prophets prophesied only about the messianic heir. So you think about that Talmudic reference and that passage in Revelation, you go, wow. There again, those prophecies were about the Messiah. They weren't about the nation of Israel, not about the new version of Judaism that the rabbis are espousing today. They were about the Messiah. So Christianity did not distort Judaism. I say current Judaism has distorted ancient Judaism. Christianity follows the ancient Judaism's way of looking at these Hebrew scriptures. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And we have a passage in John 8:56. This is right before Jesus claimed to be the I am of John 8:58. The Jews are disputing with him about who he claimed to be. And we have an interesting verse in verse 56. Jesus said, Abraham, your father, rejoiced greatly at the prospect of seeing my day. And he saw it and rejoiced. Well, how did Abraham see Christ's day? Well, in Genesis chapter 18, and I'm going to read this from the New World Translation. It says, afterwards, Jehovah appeared to him, speaking of Abraham, among the big trees of Mamre. Then he said, Jehovah, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please do not pass by your servant. Then Jehovah went his way, and when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, in this incident, um, Jehovah explains how he's going to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And, of course, Lot and his wife were there in Sodom. So the very next chapter, in chapter 19, we read about two angels arriving at Sodom in evening. And they say that Jehovah has sent us to bring the city to ruin. Now... This is interesting because in the text of the New World Translation, and when we read capital L-O-R-D in our Bible, that is a reference to Jehovah as well. We see that Jehovah appears to Abraham, and Abraham speaks to him, and Abraham sees Jehovah. But we have an interesting passage in the New Testament, John 1.18, where it says, No one has seen God at any time. So who is the God that Abraham saw? I'm going to leave that question for you to think about as we go through the scriptures. Now, the next passage of scripture we read in Genesis chapter 22, verses 10 through 12. It says, Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But Jehovah's angel called to him from the heavens and said, Abraham, Abraham, to which he answered, Here I am. 
Then he said, do not harm the boy and do not do anything at all to him. For now I know that you are God-fearing because you have not withheld your son, your only one, from him. Or does the text say from me? What does it say in Genesis 22? From me. Now who's speaking in the text? Obviously it's God and it's the angel of Jehovah. Now, something kind of interesting. If you look at John, Genesis 18, the angels that went to Sodom said, Jehovah sent us to bring the city to ruin. They're talking like, you know, they're separate from Jehovah. But when the angel of Jehovah appears, he says, you have not withheld your son from me. What I want to point out is here in these texts, we see there is a distinction between this angel of Jehovah and just general angels that appear in the text of the Hebrew Scriptures. This angel of Jehovah is special. He refers to himself with I and me pronouns, not in a second, second form. So Jehovah's angel who speaks in I and me pronouns, he receives Abraham's sacrifice. What, but angels in the Bible, what do they do? Created beings say, do not worship me, worship God. Yet this angel of Jehovah receives Abraham's sacrifice. That is a form of worship. So we see that in the text. There's an, there's an interesting, I believe this angel of Jehovah is the Jehovah who appears to Abraham, who is the Jehovah that Abraham saw. He saw Christ's day and at the, well, he was going to sacrifice his son, but ultimately Jehovah's angel provided a lamb as a substitute for Abraham's son, so his son did not have to die. What was that? What picture was that? Picture of Jesus. And what did that show? That showed us Christ's day, right? That was a picture. That's how Abraham saw Christ's day. He saw the provision that God would provide um, when he ultimately provided his son. He had that, that image of Jehovah. So I, fi I find those passages very interesting. And you can study more angel of Jehovah passages. We're going to go now to Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 through 4 and 6 and 14 through 15. I'm going to read this in the New World Translation. Next slide, please. On this slide, is Jehovah's angel the true God? Now, again, I'm using the New World Translation. So I want you to see how the New World Translation reads this. In Exodus 3, Then Jehovah's angel appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a thorn bush. God had once called to him, and he went to him to say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses concealed his face because he was afraid to look at, what does the New World Translation say? The true God. Now, isn't that interesting? The angel of Jehovah calls himself, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it, the text says in the New World Translation that Abraham was looking at the true God. Pretty awesome, huh? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I said Abraham, Moses. <laughs> this is in Moses with the burning bush in Exodus 3. Interesting, this is where Je Jehovah reveals his real name as the I am. To Moses, because when Moses says, who shall, I, who shall I say is sending me? And he says, I am sending you now. The New World Translation mistranslates Exodus 3.14 and John 8.58. But we have a Greek and Hebrew scholar who wrote an appendix article, went into depth on how they mistranslated those words in the Hebrew and the Greek. So if you, don't ask me to explain it, but you can read what he said in my new second edition of the Trinity book. We get into those verses and how the New World mistranslates those. Now let's go over to Zechariah 3. We have another interesting passage in Zechariah 3, 1 through 4. New World Translation, 1984 edition says, And he proceeded to show me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Jehovah, and Satan standing at his right hand in order to resist him. Then the angel of Jehovah. Now, I'm going to stop right here. If you look at the 1984 edition of the New World Translation, the angel of is in brackets in that phrase. In every other translation, it's the angel of the Lord, or Jehovah, but capital L-O-R-D. The angel of the Lord said, it's, um, you have Ab um, him standing before the angel of Jehovah. Then Jehovah said to Satan, those brackets, the angel of Jehovah, are not in the original Hebrew text. They added that to make it 
distinction between this angel of Jehovah and Jehovah himself. It's not in the original text. If you were to read that text without those brackets, it would say, then Jehovah said to Satan, Jehovah rebuke you. So you have this Jehovah saying to Satan, Jehovah rebuke you. Almost sounds like two Jehovahs, if you just read the text carefully, without that angel of Jehovah in brackets. Now, incidentally, the new version of the New World Translation has gone a step further in their deception. And when they add words to the text, they no longer have brackets in the text. So if you read this in the 2013 edition, it doesn't tell you that the, the second angel of Jehovah brackets words are not in the text. And so a witness can read the current edition and have no idea that that was added by the New World Translation translators. Now, you go to any other Christian Bible, it doesn't have those words, the second angel of the Lord. You have Jehovah said, Jehovah rebuke you. So there's like two Jehovahs speaking here. Now, I want you to watch what happens here in this text. Jehovah said to Satan, Jehovah rebuke you. Oh, Satan, yes. Jehovah rebuke you. Then he answered and said to those standing by him, remove the befouled garments from upon him. And he went on to say to him, See, I have caused your air to pass away for, uh, upon, from upon you, and there is clothing of you with robes of state. So what actually happened to Joshua is he's standing before the angel of Jehovah, and Jehovah says, remove his clothes so that he could be clothed with righteous, clean clothes. Now, who changes our clothes, our garments spiritually when we stand before Jehovah God? It's Jesus Christ, right? He takes our sin. In place of our filthy rags of righteousness and our wickedness, we bring to Jesus our wickedness. And when we accept him as our Savior, he clothes us with his righteousness. As Paul said in Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness that comes on the basis of faith. So you put your trust in Christ, and he takes away our filthiness and replaces it with his righteousness. And we see right here a picture of Christ in Zechariah 3. The angel of Jehovah, and speaking as Jehovah, takes away the filthy rags of righteousness and replaces it with his own righteousness. As Joshua standing before Jehovah. The two Jehovahs, Jehovah the Son and Jehovah the Father. And this is... Um, I'm going to point out a reference. I don't think I put it in the text, but in John chapter 14, I'm sorry, John chapter 12, verse 41, you read the context, and it's talking about the Jews. And so therefore the Jews um, were not understanding these things when Jesus was speaking. And verse 41, it says that Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him, and that's why they were not believing. He saw his glory. If you look at the 1984 edition reference for Isaiah saw his glory in John 14 and John chapter 12 verse 41 you check your footnote reference in your 84 edition of the New World Translation and the the glory that Isaiah saw it says Isaiah 6:1 I saw Jehovah that verse is cross-referenced in the 1984 edition of the New World Translation. So that the glory that Isaiah saw in John 12:41 which in context is Christ is Jehovah God in Isaiah 6.1. I just want to point that out too. Another example of the parallel with Jehovah and Jesus. We're running out of time, so let me go through this real quick. I'll see if I can wrap this up. So the very next slide, we're going to hit this pretty fast. you got it in your handouts, but I'm just going to hit this real quick. Can we turn over to what did the ancient rabbis understand about the Messiah? Messiah, son of Joseph. I was just telling you how they drew parallels to the Old Testament stories and draw, drew them to Christ. And in Zechariah 11:13, 13, you have a place where Jehovah is sold for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver is a slave's price. In Zechariah 12, 10, it's the, Jehovah says they will look on, now in most translations say they will look on me whom they have pierced. But the new world says they will look on the one whom they pierce. So the new world changes it. 
But in Zechariah 12.10, it's Jehovah who says, they will look on me whom they pierce. So in Zechariah 12, uh, chapter 11, Jehovah is sold for 30 pieces of silver. In Zechariah chapter 12, he is pierced. And, they are, and then in Daniel 9.24, we read of a Messiah who is cut off within those 70 weeks. And so therefore, you have a Messiah who is sold, he's pierced and killed, and another passage, you have a Messiah in Zechariah 9.9 who is humble and riding on a donkey. So the ancient rabbis were like, what do we do with this Messiah? Who is riding on a donkey, he's killed, he enters Jerusalem on this donkey. That's like what a, ha a man does. And yet, they're like, but we have another passage. In, let's go to the next slide real quick. It's Messiah, son of Joseph and Messiah, son of David. Okay, Messiah, son of David, would reign on the throne forever. So how can this Messiah be pierced and sold and ride on a donkey? And in Daniel chapter 9, this Messiah is riding with the clouds of heaven, coming to the Ancient of Days. And so they're like, well, how does he come on the clouds of heaven? That's something only God can do. And yet we have a Messiah who's riding on a donkey. Well, that's what a man can do. And a man dies, but one reigns forever. Only God can reign forever because he has eternal life. So they came up with an idea of two Messiahs coming. One would be the Messiah, son of Joseph, and that would be the one that would be suffering for Israel, that would pierce and die. And then there was Messiah, son of David, who would reign forever, be given everlasting lives and able to ride on the clouds of heaven. Like a divine Messiah and a human Messiah, and they could not reconcile how that Messiah could be one person. Well, now we go over to Sukkot 52, and I have that in your handout, um, but there's several passages, um, especially Sukkot 52 is very powerful in the Jewish Talmud. And the sages taught to Messiah ben David, son of David, ben means son, um, who is destined to be revealed in our time. The Holy One, blessed be he, ask of anything of me, and I will give unto you whatever you wish. As it stands, I will tell the decree. The Lord said unto me, you are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give the nations for your inheritance. He's quoting Psalms 2-7 of the Messiah. Once Messiah ben David, Messiah son of David, saw Messiah ben Joseph, Yosef, who was killed, he says, Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, I ask of you only of life, that I will not suffer the same fate. The Holy One, blessed be he, says to him, life, even before you stood, stand, stated this request, your father David already prophesied about you in regard to this matter precisely as it is stated. Uh, he asks life of you, you gave it to him, even length of days, forever and ever, Psalms 21.5. So they're using all these prophecies of Messiah David, seeing Messiah, who, son of Joseph, who was killed. Now, why did they call him Messiah, son of Joseph? Can you picture who that was that they saw was the Messiah that was sold as a slave and suffered with the nation of Israel? Who do we know in the Bible who was sold as a slave and suffered as the nation of Israel? Joseph, that's right. So they took those Old Testament stories and saw pictures of the Messiah. And we know Jesus suffered. He was sold as a slave. And he died for our sins. But then he was given life everlasting. Why? Because he's God. He raised his body from the dead. John chapter 10, 17 through 18. And John chapter 2, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. He, as God, is able to raise himself from the dead. The Father raised Jesus, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus, and then we see those, those scriptures in John 2 and John chapter 10, where Jesus raises himself. So in one person, we see the two messiahs that the rabbis could not figure out. And now we understand their significance of Matthew 26, 63. Next slide, please. Did, who, did Jesus claim to be God? What did they do when they saw Daniel chapter 9 being quoted? So the high priest said to him, to Jesus, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you yourself said it. But I say to you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man. That's a reference to the humanity of Christ. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. Reference to his deity, because only God can come on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest ripped his outer garment, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need 
do we have of witnesses? See, now you have heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? They answered, he deserves to die. Now, this, these references aren't in your handout, but John 19, 7 and John 5, 18 speak of the law that if you claim to be God, you were worthy you, you were, uh, of death, if you were just a human. And so here Jesus claimed to be the divine Messiah who would be riding on the clouds of heaven and the Son of Man coming on those clouds. So that there was the divine reference to the divine Messiah, and they're asking him if he's the Messiah. He connected with the divine Messiah, and the rabbis tore their clothes and claimed that he was worthy of death. Now, a little bit about Son of Man, Son of God. Je God is not a man. So when Jesus died, um, you know, he took on the human nature. And then Son of God speaks of his being equally God. And that's what the Jews understood. Son of man, son of God reference um, when he claimed those. And those scriptures tie that into one person. Now, the last part, I'm going to just let you guys look at it in your handouts. It's pretty clear. The Watchtower teaches that if you take the Old Testament passages and there's a reference to Jehovah in those passages, they would insert Jehovah into the text of the New Testament when quoting those Old Testament passages. And they try to argue they have to insert Jehovah because you get confused about whether the Lord is speaking of Jesus or the Lord Jehovah. Well, the, um, in the last slide, if we could just flip to that, um, we have Romans 10, 9 through 13 and Philippians 2, 5 through 11. There are quotes of Jehovah God that in the text are speaking in the context of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 10. I did this with an elder. We looked at the text, speaking of Christ, and then it says, all who call on the name of Jehovah will be saved. That's Joel 2.32. So that Jehovah they're calling on in, Rome, in Romans 10.9 is Jesus. If you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you get down, who calls on the name of Jehovah shall be saved. Jehovah is Jesus. And the New Testament writers uh, saw that. Then we get to Philippians chapter 2. Very next slide. This is the last slide. And flip to this. Philippians chapter 2. And I believe all this is in your hand. Isaiah, quoting Isaiah 45, 23 through 24. We have a passage where at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in, in heaven and on earth and those under the ground. And every tongue shall openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now the watchtower uses as justification for the insertion of Jehovah not just the quote of the Old Testament text, if it says Jehovah, but also if there is a J manuscript, which is a Hebrew manuscript. That is a Hebrew translation of the, of the New Testament. If they have Jehovah in the text, they're supposed to put Jehovah in there because they said they followed the J manuscripts. Well, here we have on screen a picture of a J manuscript that, that was quoting this verse of Jehovah God inserting YHWH, the Hebrew Tetragrammaton for Jehovah, in the text. That every tongue will confess that Yeshua the Messiah is YHWH, is Jehovah he uses the reference for the name of God, and what happens, what we see is the watchtower diverted from their standard and put Lord in there instead of Jehovah, because it shows Jesus is Jehovah. So um, that passage, and then there's 2 Corinthians 12, 3, another J manuscript, has, uh, no one can say Jesus is Lord, Jehovah, right? No one can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. And um, the J manuscript says no one can say Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, is Yahweh, but by the Holy Spirit. So anyway, all that's documented in my book. You guys want to check this out? You can check it out online, forjehovah.org. I have texts of my book online where you can kind of read the text in different chapters. But the whole thing, if you want to get all the documentation, you'll have to buy the book on Amazon.com. So thank you very much. I appreciate being able to share it with you all. Keep it like this. Oh, sure. Okay, excellent. Uh, this girl does some research. Do I hear? Let's let's give her a hand again. <laughs> and I have to confess, I was saying to her, you gotta, you know, we gotta get the next guy up. So I did push her a little bit at the end, but you closed that up pretty good. But definitely check her out at the table. And what's your website again? For Jehovah.org. For Jehovah.org. And for witness.org. Okay. <laughs> Four, number four. All right. Well, I'm not sure I can say anything that hasn't already been said about our next speaker. 
When I think of those who have been on the forefront of the counter-cult movement, the name Dave Henke, the name Dave Henke is one of the first that comes to me, and I had a chance to meet Dave a long, just go a long time ago. And uh, I've known about this dedicated servant of Christ uh, for quite a few many years. He is the founder of Watchman Fellowship and has helped countless people over the years break free from the mind control tactics of these man-made organizations. His talk today is entitled, The Pharisees' Dirty Deeds. So let's welcome Dave Henke to the platform, friends. Come on up, Dave. So you're going to have a handheld, and then this will also be picking you up, and Christy's got your hair coming in on this HD as well. So, Yeah, I think so. Yep, you can do that. You can do it this way, so the mic is forward. And I'll hand you that. Okay, there you go. I failed to print my notes out before I came, so I'll do it this way. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about the book that I published last year, Spiritual Abuse Recovery Workbook. Um, it's written with the idea of a person who has experienced abuse going through it by themselves if there are no one else to help them and answering the questions. The questions are probing. Uh, I try to get them to journal their emotions, their thoughts, their experience, or it can be used as part of a support group, a group of people meeting to go through it. And we recently completed that on Elaine's uh, Facebook page, uh, six hours, one hour sessions going through most of the book. But when you think of Pharisees, you think of legalism, a performance-based relationship with God. Uh, this legalism comes into, um, well, let me, due to technical difficulties, okay, still not scrolling, okay. Um, Let's do a definition first. The definition that's in my workbook is the injury of a person's spiritual health, health by the misuse of their trust to gain or maintain control over them and to use them for their own resources or benefit of the leader or group. Uh, there's two ways that this occurs in reality. One is a doctrine. Now, there was a doctrine that came into the evangelical uh, church in North America out of a man, or from a man out of China, uh, Watchman Nee, and he taught the spiritual covering, which became known also as a chain of command and an umbrella of protection. But this concept is top-down control. But we are brothers and sisters. Now, where is the hierarchy among siblings? There's not a top-down control among siblings. We are equals. And so we work together with Christ as our leader and his word as our guidebook, our directions, uh, the standards. They're the bylaws, so to speak, of how a spiritual body is to work. Uh, another way that this uh, legalism has entered the uh, Christian church is through a character flaw or personality disorder in the leadership. Uh, a narcissist is an example, a hard person to get along with, and the um, result is those following such a person have a hard time uh, dealing with it. But the, um, the problem with a top-down hierarchical control where uh, it's legalistic and controlling is that you've got to lie at the foundation of the whole system. And if you've got to lie at the foundation of the system, then you have to have a whole train load of lies to back up that one lie. And so the phrase or the expression, oh, the tangled web we weave, when at first we practice to deceive, comes to mind. So it's a whole uh, load of lies, and because it's lies, you can't be free to ask questions. So it's a chain on the mind and a chain on the mouth 
and just do what you're told to do and do it faithfully and uh, God will hear you and do wonderful things for you. But the problem with that is that when you're in such a system, you're on a spiritual treadmill. Now, I've likened this in past talks to a person getting on a treadmill, uh, following the path onward and upward towards God. And he gets on and he's walking at a brisk pace and uh, thinking, I'm going to make good progress. And then after some period of time, he thinks, I'm going to get off and check my progress. So he steps off and he looks around. The scenery hasn't changed. Nothing's different. He thinks, I need to try harder. So he gets on and he's almost running and he tires out much quicker and he gets off to check his progress. He looks around. The scenery hasn't changed. He has no sense of uh, achievement. So he gets back on and he's going to go all out. It's a full sprint this time. And of course, he quits very quickly after that. He gets off the path and he walks away. He was not on a path towards God. He was on a treadmill. And you don't go far on a treadmill. It's good if you're trying to lose weight or get in shape, but it's not good for a spiritual walk. There is a, a way of determining if a group is high control and heretical that Watchman uses a lot. Um, how many of you know the four basic functions of math? Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Uh, three or four of you. Uh, five or six. <laughs> so, you know, I'll take it from there then. We'll do our best. Yeah. Uh, okay, add, subtract, multiply, divide. When you learn this, you'll remember it many years later. I was introduced to speak to a group in uh, Opelika, Alabama, and the, uh, the pastor had heard me speak in another church where he was an associate pastor, and he said, I can remember what he said 25 years ago. Uh, the cults will add to the word of God. They do that by one of three ways. Additional books of scripture or adding words or even taking away words to what we have in the Bible. Or third is you can't understand the Bible without our material to explain it to you. And you can think of groups that do that. The second way they uh, demonstrate their cultic and heretical nature is they will subtract from Jesus. Instead of being the eternal and almighty Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, he becomes less than that. He becomes an A-God. He becomes a uh, good teacher. He becomes um, a spiritual brother, that kind of thing. Something less than eternal and almighty. And then the four, or third way that they uh, corrupt the, uh, the message of uh, the Bible is they multiply works for salvation. There are so many things on that treadmill that you have to follow to do to be saved whereas the scripture teaches it's by grace without works and uh, completely uh, of God. The um, fourth way, and this is where the spiritual abuse comes in, and that is the, um, the loyalty of the members is divided. They divide the loyalties between God and man. Now, think of the mediatorship that man needs. Uh, Jesus became a man, so he's one of us, and he can speak to his Father because he's with the Father also as the Son of God and the Son of Man. But Scripture teaches that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so we go through Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus to the Father with our petitions, our confessions, our uh, requests for help, whatever. But the thing that the cults do and high control groups do is they try to insert their man in between you and God. They try to diminish the mediatorial role of Christ. It's Christ only as our mediator. Nobody else is with him in doing that uh, work for us. But they will try to do it by saying you've got to be obedient to uh, the organization, the church, the, uh, the leader, and that if you get out from under his uh, protection or his approval, then you're open to uh, not being able to communicate with God, not being able to trust that his 
he is hearing your prayer. Now, my involvement with uh, the issue of spiritual abuse began very quickly after I published or wrote our uh, profile on spiritual abuse. And I got phone calls and emails from people saying, uh, I'm in a church naming the denomination, but it seems like it's operating like a cult. Um, can you help me? And so I would talk to the person, and I got the idea of well, this one person from Noonan, Georgia, was describing a church. And I said, are there others who feel the way you do? And he said, oh, yeah, there's lots. And I said, could you get them all together, and I'll come up and talk with them. Now, Noonan's about 60, 70 miles away from Columbus, so it's a one-hour drive. And so he got two dozen people together meeting in his home. And I went up there, with my wife and I, and I have a pyramid that I use to discuss the issue of spiritual abuse, uh, legalism, and mind control. At the foundation of the pyramid is a performance-based relationship with God. It uh, is synonymous with legalism. You have to do well in order for the Lord to love you well. And then out of that legalism arises spiritual abuse, the mistreatment of the sheep. The, uh, uh, the leaders will use the sheep for their own benefit. And then when the degree of severity of that spiritual abuse arises to a certain level, that capstone is uh, mind control. And it's at the level of mind control, at the severe end of spiritual abuse, that you drink the Kool-Aid. And you know where that concept comes from, Jonestown. You know they had practice Kool-Aid drinking in the San Francisco area before they ever went to Guyana. Um, so that was the beginning of my involvement with the spiritual abuse issue. And I look back on it and I think, you know, I went through my own experience of abuse, that of myself and my family. And I thought, where did this come from? It was out of the blue. I had heard our pastor at that time say that there was an element of legalism in our church, but I didn't know it started at the very top. And so, you know, I, I hit the warpath. I read some books, and one of the books I read was sent to me by someone whose name you know, uh, Debbie Dykstra, and it was The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse by Jeff Van Vondren and David Johnson. And so I read that, and boy, the margins got filled with notes. The underlining uh, was uh, heavy. And then when I finished that, I realized I know where the problem is. And so I ordered about 10 or 12 more copies of that book, and I gave them to all the leadership of uh, the church. And that really, that really uh, made a bad impression on them. <laughs> but it was uh, fun. Um, yeah, you look back after many years and you think that was fun actually, but anyway, um, I could tell some stories. The event in Noonan, uh, when people were gathering, I saw people coming in, there was 24 of them, and they came in with a look of apprehension on their face, like, I don't know what to expect, is this going to be, uh, a, a talk down or is this going to be recriminations? Am I going to be reported to the pastor or what? You know? And so I start going through the characteristics of legalism and I'm pretty much through it and I'm asking people to raise their hand if they have uh, something in their experience or knowledge that matches one of those characteristics and no one has raised their hand. And I thought, well, in 30 minutes I'm gonna be done. And then one person cautiously raises his hand and the dam broke. Three hours later, we finished with the mind control uh, topic. And then I was looking at the people and they were smiling, they were happy, they were hugging each other and they were, they were friends all over again. And at the beginning of this, I asked them, and this is an important element, that we're going to t talk about things tonight. You are, I'm not. I always talk about the characteristics of abuse. I don't talk about the particular group they're in. I leave that for them to talk about, because if I talk about them, then I'm the bad guy. 
And so I just talk about what the, uh, the descriptions of the shoe, and if the shoe fits, then you wear it. And so I ask them, everything we're going to talk about tonight is, should be confidential. How many affirm that you will keep this to yourself or only among those in attendance? Everybody raised their hand. But later we found out one uh, ratted the people out to the pastor, and then the pastor got on me. And he traced me down to a speaking engagement I had, and I thought, oh, this is going to be ugly. But he waited until we met in the parking lot, and um, in football terms, I basically gave him a stiff arm. <laughs> and he didn't like that. He had one of his lieutenants with him who was used to seeing people cower uh, before him, and I just basically told him uh, everything your people have said to me is confidential, uh, clergy, laity, confidentiality, and I don't have a file that I'm going to share with you. That's what he wanted. And so basically that's the way I've treated people who treat their people like uh, they are the tyrants and the people are the sheep and should obey. Uh, I have very little respect for that. And that is where we come to Matthew 23. Um, you know, meek and mild Jesus spoke so soothingly to the people. Matthew 23, um, your mom ever tell you, don't call people names? Okay, well, here's Jesus. Uh, before, from the time of the transfiguration till he goes to Jerusalem where he's crucified, is Jesus pushing all the buttons of the Pharisees, provoking them to... Uh, to do something decisive about him. He knows what he's uh, doing, and Jesus is in control of when and how he dies, not the religious rulers. <clears throat> but Jesus said, uh, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, Moses' seat is a seat in the sanctuary where the scripture, the Torah, is read to the people, and the religious leaders, the priests, the scribes, Pharisees, um, they would say, as Moses says, and quote something that he said, but Jesus said, and I say unto you, putting his uh, words above that of Moses. So that struck the Pharisees as being out of order. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Now, the Pharisees are in Jesus' presence when he's saying this. Can you see the smoke coming out of their ears? <clears throat> <coughs> but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Now, in the in Jesus' day, that was a symbol of your rank or authority. And so they're, they're, they're polishing their brass and, and so on, as we would, might say today. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called um, rabbi for one... I don't know, wait a minute, where I lost my place. Um, called by me and rabbi, rabbi, but... You do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. See? Siblings. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. The he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. <coughs> so you get the idea from Jesus' words that the last will be first and the first will be last. It's very clear. Uh, humility and servanthood are the virtues that Jesus looks out for. But as for calling the Pharisees' uh, names, uh, further in Matthew 23, he calls them hypocrites, uh, den of vipers, whitewashed tombs. And um, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, seven times. Interesting number. <coughs> Do you know what they called actors in the first century? Hypocrites. Because they're pretending to be someone they're not. They're on a stage with a mask depicting the person who they're acting out the, the role. 
but you know the it's an interesting term for the acting profession. It's appropriate, but uh, let's be careful how we use it with the actors we may know. <clears throat> uh, the Pharisees were focused on self, but Jesus was focused on his, his people. He came to die for them, to serve them, to, uh, to heal the brokenhearted. And the Pharisees required the letter of the law uh, the, the spirit of the law undercut the letter of the law as far as its um, outworking in the way they handled it. In the numerous confrontations Jesus had with the Pharisees, the people loved it. The Pharisees hated it. But as a result of the way Jesus related to the Pharisees, they sought to kill him. And it's still the same today, except without the killing. They will destroy your reputation. Uh, they will uh, break up your relational connections. Uh, God made us to be relational. We need each other. Uh, it's part of fulfilling God's purpose in our own um, life. We're a social being. But the cults, the high control groups, will strip that away from you which is a form of killing you. Robert J. Lifton's uh, eight criteria of mind control, which he developed after studying the uh, prisoners of war from the Korean War, the people who had endured the Chinese uh, brainwashing. And the last of the uh, criteria is dispensing of existence. And with the Chinese communists, it was a bullet to the back of the head. With the cults, it's excommunication, disfellowshipping, it's uh, ruining your reputation, but it has the same effect. And sometimes it destroys the individual to the point where they take their own life. <coughs> Some of the signs of an abusive group, of course, they're authoritarian, which we saw with the Pharisees. And they're always right, even when they're wrong and you can't talk to them about being wrong. <clears throat> Jeff Van Vondren said that um, how things look on the outside is more important than how they really are. <clears throat> Some of the damage caused by spiritual abuse is, um, this is one of the problems I deal with when I'm talking for any period of time. I lose my voice. <clears throat> is uh, a learned guilt. Uh, the cult will teach you to be fearful, to be guilty, to be um, insecure in your understanding of your place in life, your place in the group that you're in. And then when you're not in that group anymore, you have no mooring. You have um, all of your relations broken. And most significantly, you think your relationship with God is broken. Uh, the, the emotions that you do feel are on the, the, the negative side. Um, fear, self-doubt, <clears throat> a sense of being stuck in a no-man's land. Your sense of reality has become distorted because of the group, but you haven't had time and experience enough or learning enough to define a new reality. When you find Christ, you find a new reality reality and you, you are able to build from that time on. <clears throat> I want to tell you about some of the uh, experiences I've had with people who have been spiritually abused. I told you about the one in Noonan. There was one in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, here comes someone who understands the situation. Um, there was a group in Asheville, I won't name names, just like in the workbook, I don't name any names, because if I do, then everything I say in the workbook is about that group, and therefore, if you're something else, it doesn't apply to you. So I don't name names here either. <clears throat> but this group in Asheville, um, the pastor was... He saw himself as an up-and-comer. He was moving up the ladder of church success. 
<clears throat> and um, there was one particular businessman in the church who was fairly well off. And the pastor approached him, and you know the pastor taught tithing in the church, even though that ended with the Jewish priesthood uh, and the destruction of the temple. But he said, uh, I would like to ask you to tithe directly to me rather than to the church offering. So it is about the welfare of the leader rather than the welfare of the people. Uh, this man was being used. And <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going through the pyramid again with this group and I'm seeing the same kind of change in their countenance, um, apprehension when they arrive to, you know, freedom. And phew, that's that was a close one. We thought we were in, still in trouble, but now it's uh, not us; it's him. <clears throat> and so uh, we were able to help that group. And then I got an email from a lady in Maryland, and this was a. Um, uh, a particularly large group, doctrinally orthodox in their doctrinal statement, but they practiced their faith like a cult. And one particular doctrine that the pastor had was that if I lead this person to the Lord, then I'm his pastor for the rest of his life. Okay, well, that's kind of quirky, but he also says, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to stand there with you and give my report to Jesus about you. Oh, I got to keep the pastor happy. So see, it uh, sort of like the pastor said, uh, I want you to tithe to me. So uh, that problem uh, festered in that group and it, um, the estimate by one of the members is that their membership worldwide was about 20,000 with uh, 100 organized churches in the U.S. and abroad and 600 um, missionaries or church planters worldwide. And they, I told the person that contacted me, you need to start a discussion forum on the internet. And I suggested a site and she did and all hell broke loose. Uh, everybody broke down into one of three categories. The dissidents who objected to the way things were and they spoke out identifying themselves about it. They took a stand. <clears throat> and then the loyalists who re tried to rebut the dissidents and explain and this kind of thing. And then there was always a middle, the lurkers who would occasionally pop up and say, can't we all just get along? You know, something like that. And the, uh, it, there was an interesting um, thing that I noticed that some of the loyalists eventually came over to the dissident side. And that was very refreshing. The upshot was that <clears throat> a majority of the pastors, at least in the US, got together and formed a new organization that taught grace and was not legalistic, but they had some self-doubts. You know, they've been in this system. It's kind of uh, second nature of, for them to teach what this uh, group has taught. And I talked with one of the pastors and I said, do you understand the problems with the group that you were in? And I said, yeah. I said, because uh, he was wondering whether he ought to resign and get into some other kind of ministry. And I said, well, if you understand, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> what the issues are and what the answer to it is, <clears throat> then you're the best person to lead them out of that wilderness. And so he stayed on as pastor and he's continued to lead them well. <clears throat> I have a little uh, piece of paper uh, taped to the side of my computer screen at home because I got a lot of phone calls or emails from people talking about their uh, pastor or their leader who uh, was doing this or that and they think that it's like a cult. And I say, I go through that list of characteristics of an abusive group. And I would say, do they do this? Yeah. Do they do this? Yeah. I would go through that and when I would finish, I'd say, okay, congratulations, you're in an abusive legalistic group. It's not you. You know, you're free of that now because you've learned the truth. 
you shall know the truth, and the truth sets you free. And that was so fulfilling for me, uh, just like meeting with those dissidents face to face, seeing the transformation in their faces. I told my wife it's the most significant ministry experience I've ever had. And <clears throat> so um, the Lord took my ministry that dealt with cults, and he gave me this experience of spiritual abuse, and it turned my ministry to another direction. I still deal with cults, but I also have another language to speak to them. Debbie Dykstra described the uh, book Spirit, Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse as coming in the back door. You know, it's not a direct frontal attack on the, the strength of their, their mental strength of their system. It's holding up a mirror to them and they see their experience and they realize this is not healthy. And yeah, I've had these concerns. In fact, in one of these groups, the one that was in Maryland, uh, the lady that contacted me said that her husband was an associate pastor in this church and she wanted to get him out. And I said, well, get Jeff N. Vondren's book, read it, mark it up, make notes in the margins as to what it, how it applies to your particular uh, situation, and then leave it on the coffee table. Five weeks later, she called back and said, it worked, he's out. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, need I say that you might do something like that? But a way that you can approach this with someone who's in a cult or a high control group is to say, read this. It's about the sins in our, orga our organizations. You want to know about that, don't you? But as they read that, they see themselves in a mirror. And so it's being wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. And um, so it's been a learning experience for me. Um, I look at the experience I went through, and if I knew beforehand, I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience uh, ahead of time. But afterwards, I look back at it, and I said, you couldn't uh, deprive me of that for all the value that it's given me and uh, how I am able to minister uh, to people. It's been a rich experience. Um, but what is the purpose of such an experience? You go through a very difficult time. Uh, what do you take from it? What, what purpose did God have in that for you? Well, in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So God allowed it in my life so that I could pass it or pay it forward to the next person. And your experiences, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, God equipped you to be a special kind of help to someone uh, who crosses your path. Just be praying and expecting the Lord to bring them because after all, he gave you that experience to do it. Don't close your eyes to the opportunities as they show up. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Amen. Once again, let's tell Dave we appreciate uh, what he was sharing. I remember uh, the first church that I started, I, I it, it helped to start the church. I didn't end up pastoring that church because I wasn't really ready yet. Um, and a friend of mine came in, and then together we joined another church. And uh, this is my mentor in the Lord, and he went home to be with the Lord when he was 38 left a wife and three kids behind, and um, I've missed him every day since April of 1991, and he's a great guy, and I've often said that if I could be one-tenth the, the man that he was, I'd be pretty happy. He was a very special guy, and um, so when he died, just things, it, like, a lot of stuff fell on me, and 
the church grew from 200. I started doing a television program, different things. Long story short, we had, we had close to 500 people coming. We built a whole new wing, but something wasn't right. And I went to the senior pastor and I said, listen, I, you know, uh, I, I was now serving as an elder there. I was like, I, can I see, the, I, like, I need to see the books, what's going on. And I could, it was already, let me just tell you one sign. One sign is if you ask to see the books and, and you get called into the pastor's office or if there's some problem, some, you, you know, if they're giving you the runaround, something's not right. Finally, at the end, when I met with him, he said, well, uh, I said, it seems to me that there's money. This doesn't make sense. And the elders that he had set up there were all like in their early to mid-20s. And I could see immediately they were bobbleheads. They would do anything that he wanted. They were pretty much hand-picked. And finally at the end, he looked at me and I said, what's going on here? He said, well, you, he goes, do you remember Melchizedek? He goes, yes. He goes, well, I get paid here. And he was getting paid a very large amount. Um, and I said, what's the, what's the deal with the money? He said, well, if you remember Melchizedek, I started this church, so I am like the Melchizedek to this church. So I receive, on top of my salary, a Melchizedek tithe, meaning 10% every month on top of his salary was going to him. And about three weeks later, six of the seven elders, including myself, reluctantly, heartbroken, with tears in our eyes, when, when he just didn't see it, other than the fact that he was abusing people spiritually as well. There were a lot of problems that were going on here, and I realized that I should have been more involved in the process, but I trusted my mentor. Uh, we weren't in the building. They had a beautiful building. They had all the trappings, and, and he saw that stuff, and I'm okay with that now. But six of us just, you know, you can't force somebody. And because we loved those 500 people, we quietly resigned and walked out and left. And so... Um, you know, we have our own problems here, unfortunately, and those things happen. And that's why when I left my uh, secular business, I was always bivocational. Um, you know, I took a $69,000 pay cut, and I've always had a certain amount in mind, and I made a commitment to the Lord that I would never accept one penny beyond that because I do believe, and I'm going to be bold when I tell you this, um, I believe when, if you're going to serve the Lord as a pastor, you got to make some sacrifices. And one of them is you got you to have a limit on the money you can make. Because I just, I'm sorry, but I just think it's wrong when you look out and people are, are barely able to get by. And yet, <laughs> we, we got problems even in this area along these lines with, you know, prosperity gospel and things along those lines and whatever. And so we, we're dealing with those things here. But, you know, I, where's the sacrifice today? And I think even as pastors, we should, I, I've never asked my people to do anything that I haven't done or I'm not willing to do. I don't want to point the way, I want to lead the way. Amen? And so we need integrity here as well. You know, we're talking about a lot of things that are happening in other groups, but just talk to Dave and talk to somebody, talk to Don. We've had a few stories. You'll hear plenty of examples, even within Orthodox Christianity, where unfortunately, you know, like this craziness of, you know, you got to tie to me. I, I would be run out the door. They would, I, they would, I would be carried out horizontally. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Listen, our next speaker comes to us from Fort Myers. They are now Floridians. They've been for a few years, but they did. Uh, come to uh, convert to Mormonism in Indiana, the whole family. Um, and then they moved to the Mormon Mecca of Utah, where Mike's wife, uh, Dr. Lynn, became a BYU professor for nine years. Mike rose to the uh, position of high priest within the Mormon church. Their story, frankly, is one of the most incredible stories that I've ever heard of, of what, you know, and I don't want to steal any thunder. Maybe he'll share some of it if you haven't heard it. It's all in the book, Unveiling Grace. Don't leave without getting a copy of that book. That would be 20 bucks, Mike. Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> no, I did that of my own accord. But that is one of the best written testimony books I've ever read. And I, and I wept when I just read the book. But what has happened in their lives 
is absolutely incredible. And his talk, uh, which will be the last talk, we'll have a, a short break after his talk, and we'll set up our round table here. Um, and I also want to say this. Uh, there's a number on the screen for those watching in. If you have any questions for the round table during Mike's talk, it would be a good time for you to just type the question on the screen. I'll get them. I have my phone with me. I can get them right off the screen, and I will bring them to our round table. So if you have any questions during the next talk, send them to us. Uh, and send it to that phone number, 203-206-2828. It'll come right directly to me. So let's welcome to the platform, I'm so happy that he's here, Michael Wilder. very hard for me to hold the mic and speak, but uh, uh, yeah, can you turn it? Okay, that sounds good. Um, but anyway, I'm so happy to be here, and thank you for clapping, but don't clap for me, clap for him, okay? It's nothing I have done, it's everything he has done, okay? I'm a bond ser servant, okay? So, uh, so we'll try to make this pretty quick, because I know you're you're excited about getting home watching basketball tonight, so we can't go. Uh, <laughs> I, I've got a, I've got a, you know, I, I raised three boys in Indiana, and it was all about basketball, okay? Uh, so uh, now that my uh, uh, computer's not acting up right here, let me see if I can get in here and get this thing going. Eight, seven, four. There we go. So. To make this quick, I'll just state this. There is salvation outside of Mormonism, but there's not salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Any questions? Okay. So, but anyway, uh, we've got the, my, my wife couldn't be here t uh, today. Um, she was with family, and uh, I had a daughter about a month ago that had a, a miscarriage, so she's spending time with her. And it's the first time we've had a chance to meet with them since uh, um, this happened. But uh, uh, so anyway, you know, Al called us and to come over. And, you know, he mentioned, he says, you know, people get hyper about talking about religion all day. So um, he asked me to talk about politics today. So. Uh, <laughs> this book that my dear wife wrote, and she, she's, a, she's a true scholar. I mean, she, um, you know, one of these people, in undergrad, she got one B plus in art, rest straight A's, two master's degrees, straight A's, PhD, all A's, um, was a professor, um, tenured at Brigham Young University. And that was pretty hard, okay? Uh, and she did that in record time. And retired back in 2018 at Florida Gulf Coast University as a professor emeritus. So uh, she's been around. Uh, she knows herself. And I remember when she was writing a book, the editor I, I would interact with also would keep doing this. Bring it down. They can't read it. You know, bring it down. So, because she was writing it like it was a peer-reviewed publication. And so uh, uh, she was bringing it down so I could read it. So, so, but anyway, she's a great, she would not mention any of this, but uh, heck, she's my wife of 49 years. I get to boast, right? So, uh, but actually, we should only boast of one thing. What is that? The cross, the cross and the Lord. Okay, so jumping into this real quickly, um, I'm thankful that Al invited me. He's heard me before, and he knows the danger of having me here, so... Um, so we'll move on here to the next slide, and you'll see that we travel all over the United States. We've been from Connecticut to California, okay? Uh, you can see my dream capture up there in the top part of our RV. Um, and in, in fact, Al knows about our RV. We were parked in his driveway until he made us leave. 
Uh, so, uh, but uh, no, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So we travel all over and speak all over. And it's interesting when he, uh, um, is it Christy? You, you brought up the name of uh, Lee Baker. We met him years ago on, on the ministry. And it was interesting. My wife, when, after we met with him, he gave us a book and we read it. My wife said, something's not right. And his whole book was about coming out of Mormonism, but she said it wasn't enough, wasn't enough Jesus. Jesus was just like a side step. It's kind of like how Jesus is in the ODS church. So you always want to be in tune with people you meet of how their relationship is with Jesus. That's how you're going to see who they really are. If they speak of Jesus and they talk of Jesus and they love Jesus, then you know they're there in Jesus. So, um, and you get into so much legalism and all that stuff. So we'll, we'll hit part of this as we move along here. So we'll just, uh, next slide here. Um, what's unique about us, we were in legalism, performance-based for 30 years, okay? It's not like we just studied it. Uh, we lived it for a long, long time. So um, I... I was a high priest. I, I should not boast of that. But if somebody wants to kick, kiss my ring later on, you can. But uh, uh, That's an abomination to even think that. But there were thousands of high priests in the LDS church. Okay, And you become a high priest because of your position of your calling in the LDS church. Okay, uh, I was in the bishopric, which was like an assistant pastor in two different states. Uh, I worked on a high council for like close to nine years, which I oversaw bishops and oversaw other congregations and spoke at different congregations and so forth. And I, I remember one time I was speaking at, at, at a church um, that I was you know, supposed, supposed to be overseeing, and I spoke there, and I, I, I gave a talk, and this lady came up to me afterwards and says, Brother Wilder, that was a great talk. You are one of the most humble high counselors I ever met. And I said, I know. So, <laughs> there is a pride in men and women in the LDS church. And so many people would try to build up their vita so they could be called to certain positions in the LDS church. That's crazy, but that actually exists. Um, so my wife was a tenured professor. She had to be interviewed by a general authority. That's the people at the top. To get the job, she had to prove herself from a scholarly standpoint and everything else, okay, be approved by the bishop, state president, uh, council, all the governing board of the higher education at Brigham Young University, and they're a tough school. Their kids going into that school have the same academic background as kids going into Ivy League schools. I would say even higher now since Ivy League is going down. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, so moving on here. Um, this is us back in 1977. We joined the LDS Church October 28th, 1977, when the missionaries came knocking on the door. And I was working on a graduate course paper to finish up my graduate work in accounting at Ball State University. My wife was already teaching, and uh, I would do anything to stop work. So I missionaries knocked on the door. I'm working in this very complex graduate paper here, I'll, I'll talk to anybody, and I'll let them in, and that started it. So, so the other nice thing here is that those pants I'm wearing there, they're going to come back in style any day now, okay? I, I still have them, okay? But my wife says you can't get into them anymore. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, moving on here, next slide. Um, so here we are. This is an empirical evidence that we were baptized in the LDS church. Um, here we are about a year Three months or nine, uh, six months later, we actually go to the Washington, D.C. We lived in Muncie, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. temple was the closest temple, okay? Now, it's not like we went into the temple and then we came out with three kids. But this is, this is later on we would go back. This is how devoted we were. We would hire a babysitter that and pay that babysitter to go from Indiana to Washington, D.C., get motel rooms, and stay there for three or four days and do temple endowment work. And it was very costly, and we were not wealthy, okay? But uh, we were devoted, okay? So this is just one of the pictures. 
I think our babysitter took this picture when we were there. Um, so Lynn finishes her, her doctorate degree at um, Ball State University, applies to Brigham Young, is approved, and so I'm self-employed so I can work about any place. So we moved from Muncie, Indiana, beautiful Muncie, Indiana, to uh, Provo, okay, um, to Utah. So here we are, our strong, active family uh, in 2001. Um, my oldest son served a mission in 2001 to 2003 in Russia and Belarus. That was a hard mission. If I had any idea how dangerous it was, I would never have sent him. Here he is working with a World War II general that he helped baptize at that point in time. And, and he was so sad to see Josh leave. That picture there shows it all. Uh, this is in Russia. This is in uh, Russia. So here he is in Moscow. Okay. My other son, uh, who's a pianist, you may know some about him. It's Ma Matt Wilder. He's part of a, a Adams Road Piano, Adams Road Ministry. Uh, he served in Denmark and did a lot of musical work there. Um, and then our youngest son, Micah, that Al had mentioned about the testimony, was called to Mexico City. And here's just a quick side note to so you can see the culture of the people there, okay? We live in Alpine, Utah, which is about 99% active LDS Mormons and a very, actually a quite wealthy community. We didn't realize when we moved there, but it, it, it's a very Mormon community. The post office people called us at 5 o'clock in the morning, and said, I said, hello, said, Brother Wilder. You know, I mean, everybody's brother and sister in Alpine, Utah, okay? Brother Wilder, we've got your son's mission call here. Do you want us to deliver it like at noon, or do you want to come in now and pick it up? That's the way it was, because this is one of the biggest things your son could have happening in the LDS church is getting your mission call. So we drove down, got it, and there it is. So his call was to serve in the Mexico City mission, okay? And I'm so proud as a dad, okay, because the underlying culture in Mormonism was if you had a son serve overseas, you were righteous. If you had another son serve overseas, you were really getting right. If you had three sons called to overseas missions, you were super, super right. So that was it, it, not a scientific fact, but it was one of the things that people talked about that, oh, Brother Wilder, you have three sons called to overseas missions. You know, it's just one of those things. So anyway, athletes, all my boys are athletes. He's a star athlete, uh, a track MVP, good sh physical shape, okay? And before um, he even went on his mission, uh, he worked as a full-time endowed temple worker, the only youth that we know of in the last hundred years that's ever worked full-time in the temple before they were off on their mission and back. So uh, that was unique. So we were really there. We were really up there. Here we are in the emergency room <laughs> with my son. He was at the Missionary Training Center in Provo, he had his lung collapse. Okay, so we are now in the emergency room. And this is how trained I was when they called, the doctor called and said, Brother Wild, your son's in the emergency room. Um, I said, well, what, what happens now? He said, well, you can come and see him if you want to. I wasn't even going to go see my son. Because when we separate that from going on the mission, that's a cut. And they said, no, no, come on down. So we called and went down to see him. And what's unique about my son's gown you see there? You see he's got his missionary tag on. So everything got changed um, because he had, you know, lung problems. I didn't think 8,000 feet in Mexico City that's polluted would be a very good place for him. So he got to go to the happiest place on earth. Orlando, Florida mission, okay? Disney World, okay? So anyway, so this is the state of our family. This is a good scripture that Paul defined to the Jews about his love for them, but about their blindness. This is the status of my family here, and this is also the status of Mormons. And you can just see Paul reading this to Mormons. 
my hearts and desires and prayer to God for them that they may be saved, right? That's what we want, okay? We don't want to be mean to the LDS people. We want to help them. We want them to know the good news. We want them to know what we've learned, not what they teach. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Do Mormons have a zeal for God? Yes, they do. My family had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness. See, that's the key word, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They do not submit to God's righteousness. That's the status of my family. So this was Micah on his mission, 2004, 2006. And to make a short story here, he becomes born again on his mission, gets in problem with three weeks left. Read about it in the book. Check out Adam's Road Ministry online and so forth. And so he gets kicked off his mission. Stake president calls me up, says, we got a problem with their son, Brother Wilder. He's got, these are the very words from the stake president, he's got the spirit of the devil in him. He has the spirit of the devil in him because he believed in Jesus only. That is. So Micah came home and we sent him back to Florida because we didn't know what was going on. Our family was in a mess. Here we have this great family, two sons, serve missions. Everything's wonderful. My wife's a tenure professor at Brigham Young University. My business is all involved with Mormons and I'm doing well. Life is good. I was a very happy Mormon until this Jesus gets in the way. <laughs> but I didn't know what happiness was, though. You know, I could live all the standards and all the laws and all the regulations. I was really good. I could put my measuring tape stick up and say, see how righteous I am? I'm far more righteous than those people over there. Okay? I do all my callings and I do all my responsibilities in the church. And I have these righteous children. My wife's a tenured professor at Brigham Young University. All my, we're doing the right things. All of our sons said to us what he discovered on his mission by trying to prove the Bible is wrong and trying to prove that the Bible does reconcile with Mormonism. He studied the Bible for two years on his Mormon mission, read it over 12 times on his own times when they've had time to study and with about three weeks left on his Mormon mission, became born again. And being born again and being a Mormon missionary does not work very well. So when he came home, he just said, Mom, Dad, read the Bible as a child. Take away your Mormon concepts and read it. And he, said, and then he, he told me later on, he says, then I just gave him over, said, God, you take care of him. <laughs> his parents. He says, J just do that. So we started doing that. And, but you have to understand, as Mormons, we do not trust the Bible. That's a huge problem. Okay? Now, they pretend today that we love the Bible and all that stuff, but they really don't. The, I, at least during the time that I was in there, all the years I was in the LDS church and leadership positions and so forth, I never heard a call to read the New Testament from beginning to end. I always heard, read the Book of Mormon. This year, we're studying the Book of Mormon two years from now. We're studying the Book of Mormon again two years from now. We're going to read the Book of Mormon from the beginning to the end and so forth, on and on. But never a call from the prophet to study the Bible. So this is what the Mormons say about this. Are we on the same thing? I think we, oh, go back a couple. Um, there, that's good. Okay, as Mormons, this is what we believe about the Bible. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as it is translated correctly. Wow, okay. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God, no qualifiers. Okay, as far as it's translated quite correctly. Now, I always wondered about this. It says, okay, we have a prophet, seer, and revelator as a head of the LDS church. And you know what, we know what a prophet is. And a seer means they can see something and they can read it and correct it. Is that correct? Yes. That's what a seer is. Especially when explained in the Book of Mormon. 
So I always wondered, even when I was a member of the LDS Church, why don't they correct it? Then I realized, well, Joseph Smith did. <laughs> he, he went back and did Joseph Smith. But the LDS Church realized they were not drawing Christians. If they say, here's Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, we'll just use the King James Version of the Bible and draw in, get you to come in. Okay? Um, so, you know, you'd always read verses and wonder. I wonder if that's translated correctly. I don't know. I don't understand that. And then in my Bible, the, the one I had in the LDS church, which I still have from 1983, it tells me down certain Joseph Smith translations of that or Doctrine and Covenants or Book of Mormon or Pearl Great Price and so forth. Okay. So that's a problem, you know. We start looking at the Bible. Then we had to see what Joseph Smith said about the Bible. And, you know, he stated this. He says, I believe the Bible as it read. Did we jump to the next slide? Jump to the next slide about the prophet. There we go. I believe the Bible as it read when it came from the pen of the original writers. Ignorant translators, careless transcribers, and designing and corrupt priests have committed many errors. See, Mormons think that the Bible was just copied year after year after year through the Dark Ages and all the way up to that, not realizing we had manuscripts, second and third century, that the Bible was complete at 290 A.D. In, um, I forget what language. Well, anyway, it was complete. Therefore, even before the, uh, 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 the Nicene Creed, when they gathered to get together, the Bible was already complete. They, didn't, they just said, we're not going to add anything to it. And the Mormons said that's when they put the Bible together. No, it was done 30 years before that. So they think it was always changed over the period of years. No, it, we got the, the manuscripts, and it's amazing. King James is an amazing piece of work just to study how it came to be uh, with this basic manuscripts, like about seven manuscripts they had. But when we look at the English Standard Version, the NIV Version, and the other version we have, we have 25,000 manuscripts. And we need to take that to our Mormon friends and say, hey, guys, it's not what you think. And I could spend a whole time talking about the reliability of the Bible, but we don't have time. This is what the Book of Mormon says about the Bible. That the Bible has gone through the hands of the great and abominable church. That's basically the Catholic church and the Protestant church and you guys, okay? And that there are many plain and precious things taken away from the book, from the Bible here. Which is the book of the Lamb of God. Because of these things which were taken out of the gospel of the Lamb, an exceedingly great many do stumble. Yea, insomuch that Satan, Satan has power over them. Wow, I'd like to hear Grim, young Glenn Breck, Beck read this. Because he's so good about saying this is Satan. Uh, this is what their own book says about the Bible and about you. Because you believe in the Bible as we have it today, Satan has power over it. Is that what that's saying? I think it does. Okay. So anyway, let's keep marching on here. So here's, here's an, a magazine in the LDS Church. We would get this every month. We would read this, get the family around it, read about all the articles about that. Um, and it, it was interesting. Uh, in, I think it was in 2006 or maybe 2005, when I'm, you know, I'm trying to understand my son's writings when he's on his mission because he's beginning to sound more like Paul than a missionary. But I remember the enzyme came out, I think it was in 2000 and uh, maybe it was 2006 in December. And it had, instead of, instead of having a big picture of Jesus on there for December, you know, Christmas, it had Joseph Smith. Okay, so anyway, it, that kind of shocked me. But here it says in one of these articles, it says, In the Book of Mormon, we will find the fullness of those doctrines required for salvation, not the Bible. Then it goes out to the right side. It says here, unlike the Bible, 
which passed through generations of copyists and translators and corrupt uh, uh, people and so forth, it was tampered with and changed. The Book of Mormon is pure. Pure. Okay, we can count on it. Wow, okay. Uh, well, you can't, okay. Um, again, this is the other thing that says about the Book of Mormon. It says, behold, there are, save, this is in the Book of Mormon, there are only two churches in the world. The one is a church of Lamb of God, and the other is a church of the devil. Okay, I always like to have missionaries explain this to me. So, because I'm not in the church of the LDS church, or in the you know, Lamb of God church, am I in the church of the devil? Because here it says we have two options. We're either in the, the church of the Lamb of God, which is the Mormon church as far as they're concerned today, or I'm in the church of the devil. Something to think about, okay? Moving on here. So now you can see me getting into the Bible. This is where we go to, what, 6 o'clock? Is that correct? No, about, about 4.30, right? 4.30. Okay, I think I can make it by this time. Okay, I'll talk faster. Um, so anyway, so now you can see my mindset, my wife's mindset, okay, about studying the Bible. Can we trust it? You know, what can we do with it? So I said, I love my son. I'm not going to ostracize. See, my leadership wanted me to ostracize my son. This says, don't even communicate with him anymore. Just cut him out of the family. Don't let your children see him. Don't let anybody be in contact. But I love my son. And he was probably the most righteous missionary to come out of Utah in the last 200 years. That's before the church. More than anybody, okay? He was, he was, he was, this, he was this missionary of missionaries coming out of Utah. I said, what change? He's supposed to go out on his mission and get stronger for the LDS church. And he comes back this, this uh, crazy Christian guy who believes this in Jesus and grace. You know, a lot of people, uh, I forgot, uh, I didn't introduce myself, it's my proper pro pronoun up here. You know, we got to keep this correct, okay? You know what I call myself today? I am a biblical Christian. You can call me that all day long, and I'm happy with it. Because I used to call myself an evangelical Christian, and then I realized there's some wacky evangelicals out there. <laughs> and then I said, well, I'll just call myself a Christian. You know, I said, there's some wacky Christians out there, too. So I said, ah, I'm going to be a biblical Christian. I'm going to focus in on the Bible, what the Bible teaches, what Jesus teaches, that he's the son of God. And I feel much better. So, biblical Christian it is, okay? So, anyway, this chapter is called The Breaking of the Pharisees. It's interesting we talked about, you know, the Pharisees and their, their righteousness and their holiness. And, you know, Matthew 23 and, and people talking about other stories. So, who, who am I? Okay? So, again, I'm a high priest. Remember? My ring. Okay. And I'm also a co-chair of the Redeem the Dead Committee. This is my last major calling in the LDS Church. Now, doesn't that sound like a good Christian calling? Redeem the Dead Committee. What that means, I'm involved in temple work. Okay? That was one of the main focuses of the LDS Church. One third is temple work. Okay? So I talked about the temple. I spoke about the temple. I helped people get temple recommends. I did all these things to get people to go to the temple. In fact, when I was in the bishopric, I used to give the temple recommend Christians. You know, people would have to be qualified to go to the temple. You just didn't go there with your, um, uh, you know, and walk in. You had to be sanctified. You had to be verified. You had to have a card that said, you are worthy to enter the house of the Lord. How many people knew that? How many? Nobody? Okay, just a few. You had to be worthy. So if you would go up to the temple to go into it, if you were not a member, you'd be turned around. Uh, and if, if I were a member, 
I had to show, and it, it expired. My salvation expired after two years. <laughs> so you know, I had to get it renewed. You know, Jesus could only keep me saved for so long, and then I'd have to be saved all over again. Uh, so that was my job, okay? So I, I really didn't want it because I was questioning everything. I got this calling after my son was kicked off the mission, Okay? I got this calling after my older son, who was trying to prepare to go get a temple recommend, made a mistake and got excommunicated. That's in the book also. And that was one of the hardest things in my life I had to go through. But I worked him back and he got rebaptized and so forth. But you talk about the law, what Pastor Al was talking about. Um, what Chris is talking about being disfellowship. And Mormonism, they, they, they can disfellowship you, but if they really don't like you, they, you get excommunicated. That means you are lost. You are going to hell. It's all over for you. So anyway, we move on here. So one time after my, one of these excursions, I took, uh, and you can read about this in the break of the fair, uh, chapter 18 of Lynn's book. And you know, if you want to buy it, it's a, great, it's a great book to understand the concept of how Mormons think because we lived it for such a long time. And, uh, we, you know, we, we don't make money. Um, well, my salary, since we left the LDA Church, my salary in ministry has been doubling each year. I had to, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. It was zero when I started. It's zero times two, zero times three, zero times four, zero. See, this last year... Last year was my best year. It was zero times 17. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we put all the money back in. Okay, God has blessed me in my business, and, and that was, that's been good. But, but the books are 10 bucks, basically our cost. Okay, uh, or you can go to Amazon and get them for 20. Your choice. But it's been a huge seller on Amazon since 2013. It still ranks under Mormonism the top, you know, 30, 40, 50 books. Okay, so it's 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 it, it's a I think it's a great book. It really helps you understand Mormonism. So I come from my, this excursion, going to the temple. I take these people to the temple. We're supposed to be so spiritual. I'll come home, and my wife says, instead of picking up the Bible, I mean the Book of Mormon reading after going to the temple, I started reading in the Bible, and I started this procedure that I told my son I would read the Bible, and I'm beginning. And I look in this, and I'm going through Luke. I started in Luke, but someplace in the middle part of Luke. But Luke 16, 30 hit me. It says, Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and mammon, which is money. And we talked about the Pharisees, how they liked their money. And the Sadducees and all the certain people just liked money and power and authority. Well, the LDS church likes their money too. Okay? To get a temple recommend... So that you can live with Heavenly Father, you have to pay tithing. It's a requirement, okay? And so just here recently, there was a person who worked for the LDS Church in the finance department, was what they call a whistleblower, stated, these are the funds that the LDS Church have on the side. Not, not including Bonneville, uh, all the churches they own, the nine... Thousand, the 900,000 acres of land they own in Florida. The LDS Church owns more land in Florida than Disney. They own communications, you know, uh, KSL radio stations, they Bonneville satellite systems, and so forth. And that's worth about $50 billion. And here's this other fund. Not, not $10 million. Not 100 million. Oh, we're not there. Um, go ahead. Uh, oh, no, you're back. You're, you're, you're doing a great job. Follow me. I can't. I, that's great because I can't tell people and talk at the same time. They found in these funds $100 billion. Now, is that a lot of money? That's a heck of a lot of money. And the SEC was having problems with it because you're supposed to collect money and the church says, we collect this money to help the poor and the needy. That is a bold-faced lie. I actually have other words I can say about that. 
but uh, I can't since I'm in the, in, the other, uh, in this church here. But a hundred billion dollars. Oh, and they got fined like five million dollars for not doing it right. Five million in relationship to a hundred billion. That's immaterial. That's like a parking ticket. Okay. So the LDS church owns money. And I remember when I first joined the LDS church, going to school, not making much money. We had a child in what we call, you remember the Christian Children's Fund? We sponsored, it was like $35 back then. That was a lot of money back in 1977, 1978. But we sponsored that. And I said, well, I told Len, I said, well, we can count that as part of our tithing. No. They said, you had to drop the child and pay that to the LDS church. And I still have dreams about that. I dropped supporting that poor child in Africa so I could pay more money to the LDS church so I could get my temple recommend. God will be the judge in the long run. Then it goes on down in Doctrine and Covenants. Pastor Al, you'll like this. Pastor Mike, you'll like this. For he that tithe shall not be burned at his coming. <laughs> that, was, that was part of the law. That was in Doctrine and Covenants. So when you bring people at the end of the year, we have a, you have to do tithing settlements. In the LDS church, you would have to pay. You would have to come in, and I'd have to tell the bishop, I am a full tithe payer. Wow. Now, my wife was coming out of the church before me. She was a professor at BYU, and if she didn't pay tithing, she would lose her job. So at the end of 2006... And it's amazing how God, she just quit going to church for like October, when she became saved at the end of October uh, of 2006. She never attended church again. And everybody didn't say anything. They said, how's Lynn doing? I said, oh, she's doing great. And I did my calling, and I did all of her responsibilities because she's supposed to be co-chair with me, and she didn't do the darn thing. And at Tithing Settlement, I said, oh, how am I going to cover this? I just thought of it. My wife can't get in today. Here, I wrote her a check for, for her tithing <laughs> and paid the LDS church, which she has not paid me back yet. So we'll have to, we'll have to work this out one of these days. But anyway, you can see it's, it's a very controlling organization and brings in fear, okay? So... So you have to pay a tithing to get your temple recommend and to get your temple recommend. That's the only way you can save yourself and your ancestors. And that gets into a whole different story, which we don't have time for today. Okay. So we go on. Uh, I'm reading through this. So Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. John, John the Baptist. Wait a minute. We have a prophet today. But here Jesus is saying, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. Wow, is that a conflict? Oh, it must not be translated correctly. It's one of those verses. So we move on here. And then there's this, this thing about the, the rich man and the Lazarus, which I used to think was a parable, but I don't think it was a parable because he used a real name, Lazarus. And we all know that story, so I don't have to get in there. But, but what Abraham does when... Um, Lazarus is in his bosom. He tells a rich man, there's, there's a gulf between us. You can't, I can't send Lazarus over to help you, and you can't come to this side. But the whole concept of temple work, after you've done temple work for yourself, you go back and save your ancestors, and you move them to different degrees by you work, doing their temple work. And here, the Bible says it can't be. It is fixed. It says, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can you pass to them. But in Mormonism, the whole concept of temple work is to pass between the two. Is to bring people from the lower kingdom to the next kingdom to the higher kingdom. Okay? Now, even people who become apostates in the LDS church are okay. The only true, true apostates are a husband and wife who's been sealed in the temple who actually speak out against the, the LDS church and in their doctrine, my wife and myself, we're doomed to outer darkness, 
to live with Satan and his minions. That's a fact. That was taught, okay? So, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about it, though, because my real Jesus has got me, okay? He's got me in his hand, and he cannot let me out of that. And nobody's going to take it from him. Because once I commit to him, he, he will never, never change his mind about me. And that's the good news, brothers and sisters. That's the good news. So moving on here, um, this was probably one of the key verses that really hit me hard. The, the parable, this is a parable of, of the two men that went up to the temple. Luke 18, just read this sometime yourself. And this is in King James because this is what I was reading back then. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now, when you pray thus with yourself, you're boasting. God, I thank thee I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as is publican. I fast twice a week, and I give all that I have in tithes. Does that sound like a pretty arrogant man? Yes. And that's, was that me? And what's interesting about this, when Jesus gives this parable, he's really taking it to the extreme. Because under Jewish law, you, did only, fast, you only fast really once a year. This guy did it twice a week. He said, come on, Jesus. Come on, God. Up your ante. And under Jewish law, you didn't pay tithes on all you had, only on partially items. And he says, I pay tithes on all. You see the uniqueness there? He's really saying, I, I am so far above the law that I'm, I'm great. And what's interesting, during this same time in, in our high priest groups, and we used to meet as high priests, okay? Sounds like an exciting bunch of men. Um, so which they don't do anymore because God changed his mind about high priests meeting together. So they just, I don't think they have enough of them anymore. But, but anyway, so we met as a group of high priests. And I remember we were talking about certain things. And I remember one of the guys was speaking. He says, I thank God that we are not like other men. He used that same verse not realizing it. It was from this, I'm not like the Baptists or the Catholics or the Presbyterians or, you know, whatever out there. And it just hung on my mind, okay? Then what's so beautiful about this? I mean, I've been on the Temple Mount, been there three times. And when Jesus said they went up to the temple, up to the mountain, you went to up to Mount Moriah, and that's where it was, and it's, it's amazing, okay? So they went up. And the publican, you know, they're not going into the temple because they're not allowed to go in. They don't have the right authority. They stand on the outside or in the, in the area there that they can go and they look up. And it says here, the publican standing far off would not even look up to the temple. Or much lift up his eyes into heaven. But he smote his breath. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, let's take, really analyze that. He didn't say, I repent of my sins, and I'm not going to commit my sins anymore. He's stating he's a sinner in his current state, right? He is a sinner. But what's he doing? He's calling out to be merciful. That's what he's doing. He's calling out to be merciful. And Jesus says this, I tell you, that that man went down to his house justified. So whoever exalted himself, whoever humbled himself will be exalted. But whoever exalts himself or bases himself will be taken down. Okay? That started breaking me. I don't have the time to get into the rest of the story, but that started breaking me down. Okay, about who am I? And I started questioning everything I did. Everything I did in the Odious Church was to receive exaltation. Here's the Mormon, one of the, uh, the 13 articles of faith. Let's jump ahead here. Um, 
We believe that through the atonement of Christ, okay, this is what Mormons believe, all mankind may be saved. They should have put a period there, but they didn't. They put a comma. By obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And what's the laws and ordinances? Temple work. Being baptized, being made a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, being made a, 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 a received the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, if worthy, you become a high priest. All of these add-ons, okay? Paying your tithe. Paying your tithe. But what did Jesus, what do we know about the cross? The law was nailed to the cross, and it's done, and it's fulfilled, okay? Jesus took care of the law. Because under the law, we shall die, but under grace, we shall live. I always tell people, there's two ways you can be saved. You can follow the law 100%, or you can surrender to the foot of the cross and say, I can't do it on my own. I'm helpless. I need your help. And when we surrender and say, I give it all to you, that's what Jesus wants. Not your works. Oh, works is a byproduct. If you're really saved, you'll do good works. But good works will never, ever save you. You will never stand before God and say, see what I have done? I was a good high priest. I did all my callings in the LDS church. Oh, not a good place to be. I'll say, I can't even begin to do, do anything to save myself. It is a gift and I accept it, and I fall at the foot of the cross. I want to end up with one last thing here, and uh, what, can we just leave the slides there? You know, as I'm going through this thing, uh, and I, I talk about, you know, God in the temple, and God actually spoke to me in the temple verbally. I've only had that happen one time. And I'm in what we call the celestial room of the temple, and you have to do a whole procedure to get there. And he spoke to me when I asked a prayer, because I get into this concept about trying to understand polygamy. I try to justify it in the Bible, and I realize polygamy is not justified in the Bible. It's justified in Mormonism, but it's not justified in the Bible. And I sat there in this little couch late at night after a temple excursion and everybody else is gone. I'm by myself in a temple before they close it, like about 9.30, maybe 10 o'clock at night. I sat down on this couch and I just prayed. I said, God, is polygamy an eternal principle? Not expecting anything. And I started to get up and it's like I felt a presence behind me. And this is, see, this is so unique. It's in the Mormon temple, in the most celestial, holy places of Mormonism you can be. I almost felt a presence beside me. And I heard in my right ear a voice that said, no, it is of man. It is not of me. And when God speaks to you like that, you have to start thinking, uh, I think the foundation is falling. And it was like that next Sunday. I remember like the next Sunday I was at Sacrament. My wife wasn't going to Sacrament as the uh, standard church meeting. And I was like going to church with my daughter. We were a little bit late. So we were in the front on the left-hand side. And the first thing, the opening song was, I praise to the man, singing praise to the man, okay? And I'll, I'm going to read that real quickly just to you. Bear with me, Pastor. Okay. Um, so this is a song about Joseph Smith. Okay. And we used to sing this in church all the time. I mean, I used to sing it with all the gusto I could sing. I just love the song. And here are the words to it. Praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. Jesus anointed the prophet and seer. Blessed to open the last dispensation, kings will exhort him and nations revere. Tell me who this sounds like. Great is his glory and endless his priesthood. Ever and ever the keys he will hold. Faithful and true he will enter his kingdom. 
crowned in the midst of the prophets of old. It sounds like Jesus, but this is about Joseph Smith. Whoa. Hail to the prophet, ascend to heaven. Traitors and triumphs now fight him in vain. Mingling with the gods, capital G, S, gods, plural. He can plan for his brethren. Death cannot conquer the hero again. So this is after my experience in the temple. And I, we are standing and they're singing that song and people can see me and I could not sing it. I could not sing that song. But being weak in the flesh, I would say, they're looking at me, I will mouth it. So I just started mouthing. And it was just like, we didn't have text messages back then, but it's like God put this thing in my mind like that. Do not even mouth those words. For this song is an, imagine, is an abomination before me. You shall sing praise to only one man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. Wow. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I continued to do my activities in the church, but I was done. And I couldn't wait till we moved away from Utah. And what's... what's uh, What's so interesting about this is that you know, I, I want the people who are Mormons to know the same thing I know now. It's not about being mean against them. It's about what God has taught me. He has not I was not converted out of Mormonism by a pastor, by anybody, but purely by the word of God. God beat me up with this word. And he said, it all happened when I said, teach me. My son said, read the Bible. I said, God, teach me. And he says, you really want to know? I said, yeah, I'll teach you. And my life has changed. Praise God. All the glory to him, uh, and thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Mm. Could, could we, um, could I just, I don't know, I'm just going to trust the Lord here. But um, let, can we just bow our heads for a minute? And, just, and I just want to say this. Um, uh, maybe there's somebody watching in right now. Or maybe somebody here. I don't know. Um, but you, you just heard the message of salvation. That's what you heard. I, I don't think anybody could have put it any more clear than what Mike has just shared. And so now, it seems to me the appropriate thing to do is maybe you're wondering, how can I have this personal relationship with this Jesus? The one we talked about, uh, uh, Elaine talked about him last night. The Knox talked about him last night. You've heard about him all throughout the conference today. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says... The word is near you in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. That if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, it doesn't say you might be or you could be. It says you will be saved. For with the heart man believes results in righteousness. With the mouth confession is made that results in salvation. 1 John 5.13 says this. These things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that you may ponder, that you may wonder, but that you may know that you have eternal life. That you might know that you have eternal life. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world, 
He didn't just love the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Romans 5.8 it says, for God so demonstrated his love towards us. God's a God of demonstration. He wants to demonstrate to you tonight the love he has for you. For God so demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's inviting Jesus to come into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. Let me ask this with everybody, with, with our heads bowed in this auditorium. Is there anybody here who's never prayed to receive Christ into your heart and you'd like to do that right now? Is there anybody in this auditorium? I don't want to take it for granted that everybody in here knows the Lord. If you, if you have any doubts whatsoever, this is a good time to let us know. Amen. And if you're watching in and you've never done this, then I'm going to ask you to do this, to pray this prayer with me. I'm going to ask you to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Take over my life. I turn it over to you, Lord. I'm sorry for my sin, and I will serve sin no more. And I serve you now, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for sending your son to die for me, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. That's either for somebody now or somebody's going to be watching this. And we're going to hear something. I have no doubt in my mind because that's exactly what I felt I needed to do when uh, Mike shared uh, just in a powerful way that message. Mm, okay. I'm just in a different mindset right now. This is good. Thank you, Lord. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take just a five-minute break. If you want to go to the bathroom, do that. Come right back. We're going to set some chairs up right here. I want to invite um, uh, Don to come up. I want to invite Elaine to come up, Chris Marshall, asking you to come up. Um, I also want to ask Dave Henke to come up. If you would, Christy, I want you to come up. And Charles Kelly, would you come up as well? Would you mind sitting up here? So we got, I think that's seven people. We're going to put seven chairs there. So I need some help. Can some folks help me put some of the, break the chairs down, and just put them right here? I have about three questions that came in, and I'll ask the panel that, and then after that, We'll take questions from the audience. So it'd probably be best if you all want to. I would recommend everybody sits over to this side. Yes. Uh, down here. We'll be yeah. Down here is okay. Are we okay, Mike? If we put it on the floor here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, did it? Okay. All right. So let's get seven chairs here, and the people I asked to come up. <laughs> seven chairs. Uh, that might be, then we, let's get Mike Wilder up here for that one. <laughs> okay. So after I ask these questions, we're going to take any questions from anybody in the auditorium here. I'm going to, I'll stand. Is that okay, Mike, for the screen right there? And I'll stand off to the side, and I'll pass one mic around there. Let me invite those individuals to come on up and sit down. Mike Wilder, if I can get you up here. Uh, Chris here.
Mine up, Charles. So Elaine has a mic that you could all pass around. As well, she gives it up. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah, real quick, Mike. We're going to get going right away. Who am I missing? Mike and Chris. Mike, I'm waiting for Mike and Christy. Is it in there? Yeah, Mike's not here. Yeah. I guess you're right here, Christy. That's it down. I'd let you see them in advance, but that would be cheating, so. Oh, come on. Sometimes I grab this while we're waiting, I could get the table out of the way. Yeah. I hope you do. All my extra batteries ended up in my luggage in the hotel room, and I can't grab them. I'm like, oh, well. I could go over here and go, one minute. And everybody just started running over. Take a picture of all this. Can we stick together? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Well, maybe somebody can take a picture with me with the mic. Oh, yeah, so yeah, let somebody, somebody, somebody else. snap a few shots because I'd like to have some pictures of us. Yeah. Run. Michael, you're right here. Okay. And it, it might be nice if everybody sits over on this side because it'll be easy to ask them questions. And so, you, yeah, you jump in right here. And so feel free to get close and we can ask some questions. There, there's a nice, there's a picture of us together. Everybody smile. Yeah. Sit on my knee. Oh, I All right, here we go. All right, Mike, let's get a uh, countdown. Give me a countdown. Okay, welcome back, and this is our famed round table at the end, and we got a couple questions um, that I got earlier, so I think I have like three, and then we're going to open it up, and any questions that folks here have for, uh, for the folks here up at the round table. So we have, uh, we got Don, who's with uh, Midwest Christian Outreach. We got Christy, who's with uh, forwitness.org. We have Elaine, former Jehovah's Witness, J.W. Scape, whom you just heard, Michael Wilder. That was a powerful testimony, by the way. And we have Dave Henke, the grandfather of apologetics, if you will. 
and uh, Chris Marshall, whom you heard earlier today. And this is Charles Kelly, who runs our West Coast, who came all the way here from California. Who was How long were you a witness? I never was. Oh, that's right. You never were. Yeah, I studied with him. You, yeah, I knew you were. Uh, so you studied with him for about a year or so. Okay, good. All right, so first question. This is mainly for Elaine and Chris. Um, <clears throat> and then, Mike, I'm going to ask your uh, perspective on this, too, because you, you'll be able to jump on this as well. So as you both know, um, many witnesses have taken their lives mm -hmm. due to the practice of shunning in particular. Um, both of you have been shunned. Um, may I ask how the both of you cope with it? And so Elaine, why don't you go first, then you can hand it off to Chris. I think uh, it's been 35 years for me, so I don't know the third and fourth generations of my immediate family. You know, I did, I walked away, so I knew that I was sacrificing my relationship with them, and uh, I never looked back even once in 35 years, so how am I coping with it? I pray for them, and I lift them up, and I pray that the Lord delivers them. That's how I cope. I, I don't have any more anger. Jesus took it all away from me. He replaced the anger and the animosity that I had towards all of it. That night that I fell on my face and cried out to a God I didn't know, he took it all away, and he replaced that heart of stone with a heart of compassion. And, you know, you might think, oh, I've kind of heard that before, you know. He did it. I didn't have compassion. I was angry. I, I lost a lot. And he, he did it. So how do I cope with it? I pray for them. And I put their names in front of the uh, throne of God, throne room. So, you now, Chris, you alluded to the fact that you were getting into a pretty dark place. Yeah. So this true. question, I definitely want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. Um, Hold the mic close to you, by the way. Yes. Uh, for me, uh, particularly, it's it's definitely hard to cope. You know, um, <clears throat> just 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 what I've been through and such. You know, there's I, I'm I'm not afraid to admit there's certain mornings when I wake up and I woke up a witness still. You know, I my mindset's hard to change um, when certain teachings are so engraved. Um, the only thing uh, that, well, one of the most important things that helped me cope is, is finding mentors, you know, like you and um, Frank, helping me uh, to get through, you know, find mentors that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, people that, uh, that care about you because you are simply just a human. Um, uh, the coping does get easier, but uh, it, it is tough for sure. So let me ask you this. Where do you think you'd be if you didn't know Christ today the way you do? You know, that's a, that's a pretty broad question. Um, if I didn't know Jesus the way I did, you know, I, I'd like to think that I wouldn't go back to the witnesses, but, but honestly, if I did not know Jesus, I would go back to the only thing I did know and did know. I appreciate know. your honesty, and thank you both. So, Mike, let me ask this to you then. If you throw over the mic. Mike, you, uh, and I heard in your yeah. talk that the people over you actually were telling you to shun your... Son, so it's prevalent in the Mormon church as well. So what are your thoughts on this? Oh, yeah, yes, there's a, there's a lot of pressure um, when, uh, you know, young people will do stupid things. We know young, and they, they get excommunicated or the, church, the LDS church is not as hard as they used to be. Uh, but uh, there, there is just a lot of pressure that you have to be this and this and this and this. If you're not quite in that, uh, you get shunned. Um, you know, your jobs, I mean, out in Utah, your jobs can depend on it. There's just a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, Lim, Lim was worried about being paraded around, being fired as a professor. Can you imagine getting fired as a professor? You think she could get another job at a Division I university if you were fired? Well, because I believed in Jesus. <laughs> yeah, what else did you do? You know, it's, there's a lot of pressure on that. So, so she just quit going to church. God kept it underground until we were ready. And it, it's, it's interesting. There is just a lot of pressure. But I know, I know people who, uh, and my, my wife, dealing with students at Brigham Young, who uh, almost killed themselves uh, because of the pressure. Um, 
and uh, just trying to adapt into something that you really don't have a full testimony of, but you had to play the game. You had to live a lie, and I couldn't live a lie. Some pe people can only do that for so long. I yeah, imagine. yeah. So, so it's uh, the pressure is there, and there's a lot of well, there's a high gay population in Salt Lake City, and there's a high percentage of young men in the LDS church. And there, I know families who lost, whose sons killed themselves uh, because they, they, you know, instead of getting love and compassion, they were shunned, they were put down, they were cast out. Um, and that's what they usually want you to do is cast out. Um, the, old, the old saying in Mormonism was that if your son goes on a mission and he comes, you'd rather have him come home in a pine box than to come home with a dishonorable discharge. That is the concept. Wow. I, that's at least in my time. You know, they change things. They try to adapt. Uh, but um, it's still a lot of pressure. It still is. Right, Don, did you want to say something? I, I do. It's a, uh, it's a little bit different take in terms of timing. Uh, one, one of the calls we've had, and we've had these a, a few times, was from someone who was a Jehovah's Witness who believed the Watchtower was true, but realized they could not live up to the expectations and believed that because they couldn't live up, their family would be destroyed at Armageddon. And so they called to find out what we were doing before they committed suicide. And then, as we talked with them, they ended up coming to the faith, she did, her husband did, and as we were counseling them, it turns out the husband was also contemplating suicide, and they never discussed it between them for the same reason, because he believed he was going to prevent his family from going through Armageddon uh, and being in the kingdom. Yeah. So there's pressure inside and outside. Yeah, unfortunately, in Michigan, that mother killed her entire family. In yeah. fact, Hamburg, Germany, the bombing, or that, the, the mass shooting, that was at a Kingdom Hall. It was a guy who was being shunned. All right, this is for um, Dave, Don, and Christy. And since the three of you have been doing this for a long time, reaching folks with, you know, within uh, these pseudo-Christian groups, what's the biggest change in reaching individuals over the years? That, what's the biggest change you've seen in reaching these individuals who are trapped in these organizations? So we'll go from Christy uh, to Don, and then we'll go over to... Uh, well, the thing that I've noticed, because I started talking to people in the cults back in 96, 97, when I was studying Mormonism, and I've seen a big change in just the LDS people. Uh, they used to admit to more of the false doctrines. Now they're trying to sound more Christian all the time. They're um, covering up things. You know, you had... You know, the, the, when, like I asked my cousin, do you believe that you could become a god? I mean, he was serving a mission for the Mormon church. And the first time he kind of covered it up a little bit, but then he admitted to it. And there wasn't a lot of reinterpretation, if you will, of the statements. So for it's almost like I have to, in, in some cases, educate the LDS people as to what the churches teach and how it's not. Almost biblical. like you know more than they do. Well, yeah. I certainly found myself in that position, that is especially so true. with Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, and the Jehovah's Witnesses definitely. I mean, I, I see a difference. Um, seems like the younger generation is falling away in these cults because of the Internet. There's so much out there. You see this in Mormonism. They now have to admit with the church essays. You know, that going on the church website now trying to explain away the polygamy that just 10 years ago, you go out and dress as the wives of Joseph Smith out in Manti at their pageant, and they had no idea that Joseph Smith had more than one wife. Now they're like, okay, now they have their excuses for the polygamy. Oh, it's from God, and God, you know, had that for a time and all this other stuff. But it, it, they're having to admit to more. But on the same token, I see also just in the young generation what we're seeing in culture in general, the... Well, that's nice for you to have your beliefs, but I have mine. Relativism. That's that relativism is very yeah. strong now. Right, so let's get Don's uh, yeah. feelings now. What are some of the big, most changes that you've seen? You've been in this for a long time. Well, organizationally, I, I agree with uh, her. The Watchtower's done the same thing. They had uh, 
because we used so much of their material, they had to finally produce sort of a history book to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. So I could sort of admit to it without fully admitting to it, so a vaccine, if you will, a, uh, a heresy vaccine. <laughs> So that they can continue teaching this stuff without really allowing their people to be uh, upset by their material. It used to be when we would write articles, the Watchtower read our stuff, and the next Watchtower would be responding to what we had written. That was really kind of fun. Uh, now they, the second thing that they've done is they don't mail the material out any longer. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to have a, a, a Jehovah's Witness come attached to the Watchtower in order to get one. Uh, the, we used to be able to just get a mail to us. So we could have a name like, uh, I don't know, Diane Golson had hers as a N Natasha Apostate, uh, <laughs> which is kind of fun. The, but from my perspective, since I deal so much one-on-one, -on -one, things haven't changed a lot for me because my first question always is, why are you what you are? Mm -hmm. And if I don't ask that question, I'm not gonna speak to the issue that's keeping them in. Okay. Dave, you've been doing this a long time, so what, what changes do you, I know you're not the president anymore of Watchmen, but you stay active. You were just saying the other day that you got a phone call, so I know that your phone's still ringing. What, what are some of the differences? Yeah, there are two things. One is the internet. Uh, used to, you had to have the original book uh, to show a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon something from uh, years gone by. Otherwise, they'd just say you were lying to them. Uh, now you can find all those things on the internet. And as James Walker says, the internet is where the cults go to die. Uh, you find growth in um, countries that are not as advanced as Europe and North America, uh, but they're basically static in yeah, I, those I've, areas. I noticed the numbers in the Mormon church, they're growing in African nations where Internet is poor, this, that. I mean, yeah, yeah. absolutely, I've seen that. And the other thing is there is a um, massive cultural shift going on in the world uh, involving moral and sexual kind of things. And the cults are, because they've been so rigid, are having a more difficult time adjusting to that. Uh, you can't just uh, make a rule and stamp down hard because the, the culture has shifted to resist that strongly. And so only uh, an, a, an understanding of the gospel and a gracious presentation uh, is the answer to that shift going on. That's an excellent comment. Charles, you've been doing this for a while. Why don't you take the mic and what do you, what, what do you see? What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, one thing that I've seen is how the Watchtower has, uh, they are progressing in deceiving. Uh, you know, the things that they find out that are against them, they're finding different ways to, you know, like uh, Proverbs 8.22, they're finding different words and different ways to cover up what they've done wrong or to prove their lies or to make their lies look like they're truthful. So we have to really be like Jesus said, you know, like foxes and things like that, you know, in order to really be effective in how we approach them to get to the head. But personally, my, the one thing that has been most successful for me is the Bible. You know, I, I usually just ask, I says, if I can show you one thing in the Bible that's different from what the Watchtower teach, will you allow me to show you a second one? My answer is always, you can't show me one because everything the Watchtower teaches is in the Bible. So then I come back and says, just humor me. Let me show you just one thing. Then when I, you know, there's a lot of things we can show them that it's different from, you know, the, where the Bible is different. And if you just give them a choice after you show them the differences, do you, are you going to follow the Bible? Are you going to follow what Jesus said? Or are you going to follow what the governing Bible and, said? And that's where your ministry comes in, Elaine. You go study by mm -hmm. stuff. How many videos do you have? You, you, I was going to say, there's a ton of videos. And that you, you, like, you do that eloquently. Just It's like plucking a chicken's feathers. Okay, Mike, we got a question for Mike here. Um, all right, so, Mike, what do you see uh, happening in the LDS church today? And what do you think the future holds for them? Well, they're very good at adapting. And I always use jokes a lot of times about how God changed his mind. 
because their doctrine keeps changing. Their core doctrine is the same because it's, it's, there hasn't been any revelation per se since 78. But the administration aspect of it, uh, the, how they interact with people, um, how they're much more compassionate on certain things because they want to keep people in. I mean, it used to be, if you just asked back in the 80s, if I just said, I want my name removed from the LDS church, they'd do it like that. Today, you could write a letter. You could work on it. It, it took me, you know, six months uh, to get my name off. And I hear some people try for years and never get their name off. But, uh, at, but they're very misleading, just like uh, the gentleman down here was saying about their doctrine. Okay. You go to Google. If you put in Jesus Christ, you know what comes up first? Unto Christ, right? Is that the Mormon site? Right, right. The, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Learn more about Jesus. They've got the money. I was showing you on the internet. They have the money. They're buying, they, they have a lot of influence through the media, uh, and they will, you know, they'll even work their doctrine even into a new age concept. A Bonville to attract Entertainment. Young people. Isn't that part of the Mormon Church? Bonville Entertainment? Or whatever that Bonneville. is. Bonneville. Bonneville. Uh, yeah. And Vid Angel. A lot of people don't realize that. Where the chosen that's is that's now. all run by, that's, yeah, uh, a, the chosen. That's, an, that's another You story. know, a lot of people love the chosen. Yeah. But I've been in it so long, I can see in the move, in the shows, the ones I've watched, and I can't watch them anymore. I can't. The influence of Mormonism in the doctrine, in the procedure of the LDS Church. And when Jesus comes up in that trailer of the chosen and says, when they were challenging Jesus about they were about to bring the law of Moses upon him. He says, I am the law of Moses. That's not biblical. That's not in the Bible. He is much higher than the law of Moses. The law, the law of Moses even states in the Bible it was a dysfunctional law. It was to bring men to Christ. Do you believe that that came out of Mormon? Oh, there was no question about it. It didn't come out of uh, Mormon influence. They are, Mormons are co-creators of yes. that show. He doesn't uh, run it all by himself. I'll okay. just quickly say this. Dallas Jenkins was on uh, a program, and he made the claim that, well, we all serve the same Jesus when he was at. I, to his credit, I immediately met him on Messenger and said, hey, wait a minute. We need to talk. I said, you just made my job that much more tough. The, the LDS church has been begging for a place at the evangelical right. table for years. You yeah. know, they, they try to join the World Council of Churches every year. So him and I, we engaged each other. And wow. after a while, he said, okay, I'll take what you're saying. And then I noticed I, it was Elisa Childress or somebody he was on with about a week later, and he said, I probably shouldn't have said that. And so I texted him back and said, good for you. Yeah. It was good he did that. Elaine, same question for you. The Watchtower, what's happening today? Where do you see it going? And then we'll take questions here from anybody who wants to ask. Well, oh gosh, I'll just say this. And I just learned this. A, a lot of the pieces came together for me about a week ago because I was listening to Fritz Springmeier, if you know who he is. <clears throat> who is he? He's a former witness who wrote a bunch of books. I don't remember his exact story, but uh, he's been researching it for decades. The thing is, is we know that their message is a message of doom. It's to bring in the apocalypse. I told discussed that in my message last night. They follow the first rider of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The thing is, and, and they had the boots on the ground, all of us out there knocking on doors, spreading this message of doom. So that is what's really behind the organization. And their message is out. They are imploding now. It's an old people's religion. Once the older crowd dies off, listen, the younger ones, I know, I hear. Listen, I get between, I used to get 100,000 views a month. Now I'm getting between 30 and 50,000 views a month. I'm, it's not because anything I'm doing. It's because this is my message because this is how many witnesses are getting out. And I see your Facebook page. Every day there's somebody on there asking if anybody's familiar with her Facebook page, right, Martha, you see those? I mean, I'm just, so, there's a couple of times I've been on there for an hour or two, and I'm like, how are you answering all these I'm people? I'm not. It's Jeanette. Jeanette's, right, we need to pray. We, you two should be up here in the middle. Are you kidding me? Are you telling me you guys are the ones answering all those people? 
See? She. I mean, how, you're getting like, I you call must be it, inundated. The, here's the point. It's not me by, by any means. Amen. This religion is imploding. They don't care because their message of doom ha is out. Mm -hmm. They can't go door to door anymore. They're getting caught in their crimes, the pedophilia cover-ups. They're folding. I don't think they care because the message is out. Their God is, try is trying to rise to power, but he's been conquered. We're on the winning team. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. All right, so we got a couple more minutes, as long as there's any questions. Bill? Yeah, hold on. Let me, I'll, I'll just come out. I'll do it from out here. Remember Kingdom Hall? There's a nice story. Yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a Mormon man, I know that you aspire to be a god. What do women aspire to be? Well, I, I told my wife I'd allow her to be a god, too. So, no, women, women would be goddess. They would be, uh, a man couldn't become a god unless he was married to a woman. Okay? So, the, <laughs> the women were, I, you know, they were, I, I mean, it's, this is this hocus pocus stuff we're even talking about. But, but the fact is that um, men would become god, women would be god, what do you call women god? Uh, well, goddess, I, yeah. That's that's would be. Is it again. true that the women will not even be resurrected and come out of their graves unless you call them yes. and you call yeah. them by this name that you yeah. heard in the temple? The name that, that I true? received uh, in the temple for my wife was called was Caroline, and uh, that that when I would be a raised, resurrected, not by Jesus, but by my priesthood authority. I mean, this is doctrine. This is in the LDS Church. I would be raised, and then once I'm raised, I would call forth her name, Caroline, not Lynn, but Caroline. And I always used to tell her I'd call out the wrong name and raise somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd have to. Well, but, but the other thing that's still true is that, you know how the, the answer that about polygamy, that sounds silly that I'd have to get an answer from God. But in Mormonism, we were embedded with that and that. Polygamy was removed from practice because on the earth because the LDS church has good lawyers. And they said, don't do it. It'll get you in trouble. But it is still taught as an eternal principle. Okay? The current prophet now of the LDS church, he's married to a wonderful person and sealed to her, which means married for this earth and the air. But his previous wife died also years ago. And he was married to her and sealed to her. So he's sealed to two women. Joseph Smith was sealed to hundreds of women. Okay. And uh, it just, it's, it's just outrageous. I actually promised my wife that when we were embedded in Mormonism that I would not get sealed to another wo woman in the hereafter. Well, I know when I have intense fellowship with my wife, <laughs> I'll just go, you want me to call you out, right? <laughs> One question I have about Mormonism is this involves the current attention to uh, uh, the role of women and especially the idea of covenant marriage, eternal covenant marriage. And with that, Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, they are in an eternal covenant relationship. How come there's no more attention given to the Heavenly Mother? Is that being increased or is it being downplayed? Well, okay. I'm wondering, is there a change in attention or theology involving the Heavenly Mother? Okay. The, the reason, I don't know if you want to answer this, but the reason, from my understanding, they always told us that people use God's name in vain. We hear that all the time, okay? So to protect the mother is to not put emphasis on her that people would not have blasphemy against her or make fun of her or anything like that. But in Mormonism, there is a heavenly father and there is a heavenly mother. No doubt about that. That's taught. And Jesus is a spirit child, is a first spirit child of a heavenly father and a heavenly mother. If we go back to the other prophets, and if we go back to the proper teachings of like Doctrine and Covenants 132, heavenly father has to have more than one wife. 
has to have, and that Jesus was also married and has multiple wives. And anybody who wants to progress to the celestial kingdom and to eventually godhood has to have multiple wives. Now, a lot of Mormon men would sit here, so that's a lie, that's a lie. Well, you know, I've been in it so long, I can just dig through their scriptures and say, here it is, it's still there. I haven't seen your current prophet. Cancel it out. Doctrine and Covenants is one of the most abusive things that ever is laid in scripture for Mormonism, and it's given by Joseph Smith directly, directly, I mean, given by Jesus Christ, according to Mormons, directly to Joseph Smith. And it tells women, if they don't bow down to their husband and let them practice polygamy, they will be destroyed. It's there, period. Current scripture. Anyone else? A question? Any other questions here? Going once. Going twice. Okay. Well, listen, um, this has been a wonderful blessing. Um, for those of you who have been watching in, we are so grateful that you've been with us this last day and a half. Um, I want to thank the panel. Can we give the panel a hand right here, please? Okay. And so what I'm going to do is, Frank, if you don't mind, I'd like to invite you to come on up and just close in prayer for us and end the conference for us. So let's all stand together if we could. And we'll have our brother close us out. And thank you. So just to confirm, we are closing the conference out for today, but it continues tomorrow. Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I, thank you, thank you. I need to say Here, that... You I, should probably have this mic. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I forgot. Um, sorry about that. So Don Vino is our guest speaker here. Yes, sir. Um, our congregation is Greater Grace Chapel. We're going to be joining with Mike's congregation right here, uh, First Baptist of Port Orange, and that'll be at 11 o'clock. Now, Mike, is there going to be a Bible study tomorrow morning? So there'll be a Bible study here at 9.30. Um, there'll be one here that Mike's doing on Genesis, and there'll be another one in the other room that they're doing. So you can join either one at 9.30 tomorrow morning, and then our final service will be at 11 o'clock for the conference. And it's Palm Sunday, so I know Don is tailoring his message towards that. So he may not necessarily be talking about apologetics, but we hope if you're here I'll always tonight. always talk about apologetics. Yeah, he'll get it in there somewhere. Um, Please join us. So that, thank you for that reminder. No problem. Thank and you. while you were talking, the Lord spoke to me. I would like to invite everybody who's here to come on up and to lay hands on our seven panelists. Come on. Sure. Don't be shy. We've been, been together. Some, some are spouses here, so you definitely should come up. And uh, let's just anoint them and just uh, pray for their ministries, whatever is going on, whoever they're going to talk to. Thank you very much. Come on up. Lay hands on them. Father God, we thank you for what you've accomplished over these last 36 hours and what you're going to do tomorrow at this service. And Lord, this is just a, a, another beginning. Um, the people who uh, hold these conferences throughout the year in different territories, the different areas of, of this country, but now we also have the, um, the great privilege to be able to reach people all over the world through the technology and the media. Um, that is that is going to go forth, Lord. So we know that this is not the end, uh, but again, just another uh, rewind and beginning. Lord, as we lay hands on, on uh, these anointed ones that are called by you um, in all the different ways that we've heard, in all these different stories, um, there's just like I get to experience on the west coast of Florida, there's a different sunset every night. And you call people in a different way, however you want them to be, however you ask them to be. Lord, I just pray that all of us, everybody who hears this and will hear this, understands that when God calls you, trust in his character. Say yes, even though you don't understand, because we all, just like the Israelites, we take that step of faith. We pray that the waters will part we know that we will walk on dry ground, and we know that you told him that I have already won the battles for you. Though there will be wars, there will be fights, but we trust that you will be victor for us and that we bring others through that dry ground with us, Lord, and then on to eternity. Lord, we just thank you for everyone who's participated 
And uh, we just ask you to continue to bless their ministries, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock live stream.